What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If Eshirama Had A Grandson With Wood Release? Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. After a few hours, the Hokage arranged a meeting with Jiraiya. This was a meeting Jiraiya had requested. Quite curious to hear what his student wanted, the Hokage readily allowed it. Sensei, what do you plan to do about Orochimaru? He has left the village, and one of my contacts picked up that he was near Kumo a few days earlier. Jiraiya started the meeting with a grave voice. The Hokage's eyes widened with surprise. He had indeed not been able to find that intelligent student of his. So, this was the reason. Moreover, near Kumo? He didn't doubt the information Jiraiya provided him. He was aware that Jiraiya may have many faults, but he wouldn't lie about something which endangered the village. Did he mention anything to you before he left the village? Is he on a spy mission? As he didn't receive an answer for a period, Jiraiya continued. Keep tracks of him. If you find out that he has betrayed Kanoha, show him no mercy. Sarutobi Hiruzen said with a bone-chilling voice. Jiraiya was a little startled before he nodded his head. All right, but there was another thing I want to tell you, Sensei. Jiraiya's voice was quite light-hearted at the moment, so the third Hokage relaxed a little. Speak. I will be sending my apprentice, Minato to aim. But, not as a part of the elite shinobi that you are sending. Meaning, he won't be accepting any orders from Hanzo. The third Hokage raised one of his eyebrows in question, but he didn't interrupt Jiraiya. He was waiting for him to finish speaking. He will be managing my spy network inside AIM. I want to mold him into a spy master for Konoha. Jiraiya finished speaking soon enough. These words did make the third Hokage fall in deep thought. This wasn't a bad proposal. The boy was smart and mature from a young age. He was also quite powerful for his age group. If this boy started to meet Jiraiya's contacts in AIM, there would eventually be someone other than Jiraiya who would have some hold of his network. Currently, even the third Hokage had little to no idea about Jiraiya's spy network. The code words they used or anything else. It would be better to prepare in case Jiraiya was unavailable for some reason, or something happened to Jiraiya. Alright, you have my approval. The third Hokage accepted readily. Thanks, Sensei. With that, Jiraiya jumped out of the window. A tick mark appeared on the third Hokage's head as he saw Jiraiya using a window instead of the door. Before he could even shout at his student, Jiraiya had disappeared. As Jiraiya left, the Hokage murmured with a low voice, Orochimaru. Orochimaru was his disciple in which the third Hokage took the most pride. It was because this disciple was the most cunning out of the three he had taught. The third Hokage had spent a lot of time in molding Orochimaru into the next Hokage after himself. However, he had slowly realized that Orochimaru held no loyalty for Konoha. No. It would be better to say he was just apathetic towards it. He felt neither love nor hate for Konoha. Orochimaru just felt that it was convenient for himself to stay there. After having realized Orochimaru's feelings towards Konoha, the third Hokage had given up on handing over the seat of Hokage to him. Now, he was looking for another successor. The only one who fitted the current description would be Jiraiya, the Toad Sage, Tsunade, the Slug Sanin, and Hataki Sakumo, the White Fang. However, he also held a glimmer of hope in some young talent rising up with strong power, someone who could be entrusted as the leader of Konoha. Meanwhile, after having met up with the third Hokage, Jiraiya had come to the Senju clan manor to meet up with Araki. He informed him of his conversation with the third Hokage. Upon hearing the entire story, Araki scowled in response, and he said, Why did you go and tell that old fool about it? I think you should be aware of how much I hate that monkey by now. Jiraiya looked into Araki's eyes and said strongly, Araki, I think you should keep better control over your emotions. 
I know you hate sensei, but remember that you can't allow it to influence your thinking or future decisions. It is unbecoming of a leader. Araki quietly listened to Jiraiya's words. He knew the man was right. Since the day he had met that old monkey, he would get angry just by hearing his name or his title. All right? He softly muttered while accepting Jiraiya's advice. To this, Jiraiya was lightly surprised. He was expecting an outburst from Araki. It went far too smoothly that he had trouble believing his eyes. Anyway, I guess I will tell you of the reason as well. As you know, Minato wants to become a future Hokage. Araki nodded at this statement. I have been aware that Sensei was personally molding Orochimaru to inherit his position after him. However, now that Orochimaru has now left the village, Sensei would naturally start thinking of other people for the Hokage's post. I think he might be considering my name, Sakumo's name, or even Tsunade Haim's name. However, he is unlikely to make any decision until he feels his power slipping. And for that to happen, another decade would pass. To this, Araki simply snorted and thought, he definitely won't be alive to see the next decade. Not if I can help it. Although these were the thoughts in Araki's head, he didn't interrupt Jiraiya. Jiraiya continued from where he left off, I wanted to give a hint to Sensei that Minato could grow up to be a reliable person who could be handed the seat of Hokage. Araki rolled his eyes in response after Jiraiya finished speaking, by that time, the third Hokage would be long buried in the ground. I would have enough of a say in who becomes the Hokage. You could have left it to me, you know. To this, Jiraiya shrugged and replied, I must do all I can for my apprentice. All right. Was that all you said to him? You didn't mention anything about a Senju clan member joining Minato, right? Araki knew Jiraiya wouldn't be so stupid to mention that, but it never hurt to ask. Don't worry about it. I didn't mention anything about the Senju clan. Jiraiya waved off Araki's worries quite casually. Araki then asked Jiraiya, so, what are you planning on doing now? I don't think the Hokage set you free from any duties. Yeah. Sensei has told me to keep track of Orochimaru's trails and find out if he betrayed Konoha or not. If Orochimaru has indeed betrayed Konoha, then I must show him no mercy when dealing with him. Araki gave him a smile, that's relieving. It means Orochimaru won't die anytime soon. After they concluded their conversation, Jiraiya met up with Minato and informed him of a few things before leaving Konoha. Minato and Uzumaki Aisao left for aim soon enough. And as for Araki? He left Konoha, leaving Kushina and Tsunade in charge of the Senju clan manor. He was sure that Kushina and Tsunade would be able to keep the Senju clan manor safe in his absence. Near a year had passed since Konoha had sent their shinobi to aim. Kumo had started empowering its borders in these years. In response, the Hokage assigned Hitaki Sakumo near the borders close to Kumo. The Hokage had even sent envoys to Shimagakure, asking for military access so that they could attack or lay an ambush for Kumo. Shimagakure agreed readily, but they also expressed that their people wouldn't join this war from either side. The Hokage had no issues regarding this condition, he also believed that it would be best if their village remained neutral. As for the Yugakure, which lied in the middle of Shimagakure and Kanoha? They were given an ultimatum that they should allow military access within their land, or they would meet with the troops led by Hitaki Sakumo. The next day, the daimyo of the land of hot water sent his agreement regarding the alliance with Konoha. The third Hokage cared little about their agreement. It was to be expected that the threat would work. If not, it would be a good chance for Konoha to expand its borders. Now, coming to an even more important location. The land of rain? This was the location that was carefully observed by Konoha and IWA. The Hokage had sent 100 shinobi, these shinobis were from well-reputed clans in Konoha, excluding the Senju clan. Not just well-known shinobi, but even young shinobi had joined them. In turn, IWA had fortified their borders by reputed shinobi whose fearful names had entered the bingo book. Many of them could be classified as a ranked or a plus ranked shinobi, while one of them was the rare S-ranked shinobi. For half a year, nothing significant occurred in AIM. Just a few skirmishes now and then, and even low to mid chunins could take care of them. During this time, Tsuchikij asked Hanzo to let his shinobi travel through AIM. However, Hanzo clearly denied any passage between AIM. Hearing that Hanzo had rejected his deal, that Tsuchikij was naturally infuriated. 
He asked Hanzo one more time before Hanzo rejected the deal again. The reason was because of his alliance with the third Hokage. If this was during the time when Hanzo was working with Danzo, he would have allowed the Iwa's forces to travel through AIM. However, the third Hokage was another man altogether. If he tried to pull back from the alliance now, the third Hokage wouldn't delay in personally coming and fighting against him. And even as strong as Hanzo was, he had no assurance of winning against the third Hokage. This man had survived two great shinobi wars and was about to see another one. There was no way Hanzo could underestimate him. Now, after half a year, the third Suchikage had ordered his forces to start moving towards the aim. Although he didn't feel that his forces were ready for an attack on a village, they could still create some problems for AIM Shinobi. It was to make the situation even more chaotic so that Hanzo would be forced to spend on stabilizing his village before dealing with the IWA forces. Moreover, during this half a year, the third Suchikage had received info from his spies that Konoha had sent many talented Shinobi to AIM to show their sincerity and temper these young Shinobi. Although these young shinobi had come to temper and their families must have been prepared for their deaths, their deaths should still strike a strong blow in the heart of Kanoha. The relatives of these clan members who had come to the aim would probably fall in despair, or maybe, they would burn in anger. Either of these two was good for IWA. If they were in despair, they were one step away from becoming a dead body in a war. And if in anger, it was possible for them to be extremely rash and almost all experienced shinobi were aware of what happened to a rash shinobi in a war. The only thing awaited him was a crushing defeat or death. With these thoughts in his mind, the third Suchikage didn't hesitate in ordering chosen groups to advance towards AIM. He was well aware that with public in chaos, and Iwagakure charging at AIM, Hanzo wouldn't hesitate in sending Kanoha shinobi along with the AIM shinobi to hold them off. This was quite a good tactic from the third Suchikage. However, he still couldn't anticipate what actually happened on the ground. Naturally, he wasn't aware of, Namikaze Minato's potential, Achiha Kashiro's strength, and the true fearfulness of Nara Shikaku's mind. There was also the fact that Minato was in AIM. However, he rarely met his friends at AIM. It was mostly because for half a year, other than small skirmishes, IWA hadn't taken any real action. Minato utilized that time to get himself familiarized with Jiraiya's contacts. After every three days, he would meet a new person and learn new things. And, during the evening time, he would be spending his time examining the flying Raijin Jutsu and learn more about seals from Uzumaki Aisao. Now that IWA had started moving against AIM, these young shinobi from Konoha were being sent to the front lines more often than not. Minato joined them regularly because, just as he had said to Araki, he did not wish to stand by and do nothing while his friends were fighting. He stopped examining the flying Raijin Jutsu and used that time to learn more about seals. He had changed his time to meet with Jiraiya's contacts. Now, he had to contact them at the night time. Needless to say, his time to sleep had shrunk to 4-5 to five hours a day. Among all the Konoha shinobi, three people had made the most difference. Minato could be grouped among the reinforcements. He was one of the first ones to arrive when they were under attack. He had his first kill here, but before he had the time to even register it, he killed the second one, and then the third. Only after did he return home did he experience a suffocating feeling. However, he still moved past it with little to no help. He was aware that this was the true reality of a shinobi and must be accepted as early as possible. His friends weren't the same as him, though. But fortunately for them, they talked to each other about it. However, he wasn't the one who had truly made a significant impact on Iwa's forces. Well, it couldn't be helped, considering he was focusing on reinforcing the allies. The ones who had truly made an impact against IWA were none of the other two. Achiha Kashiro had killed two A-ranked shinobis of IWA while fighting against them at the same time. Meanwhile, Nara Shikaku had commanded a small group of shinobi and destroyed four to five times the number of his enemies. Even though their progress could be called quite great, the AIM and Kanoha suffered losses as well. Out of 100 shinobi sent to AIM, only 60 or so remained. Perhaps because of the report of heavy losses against Kanoha, the third Suchikage had urged the S-ranked shinobi stationed at the front lines to make his move. And in the tenth month, the S-ranked shinobi from IWA personally made his move. However, shortly enough, 
the third Suchikage would come to regret it. The S-ranked shinobi of IWA, named Shimoda Takeo, with the title of Iron Hand, had received a special order from the third Suchikage. The order entailed that he must make a move. And he must kill either Nara Shikaku, Namikaze Minato, or Achiha Kashiro. Choosing Nara Shikaku was a lot riskier since his position was quite deep in his allies. Even though he was an S-ranked shinobi, Shimoda Takeo didn't dare to be overly arrogant in his abilities. He was well aware that if Hanzo received information that he had made a move, Hanzo would come as quickly as possible. And, the shinobi surrounding Nara Shikaku shouldn't have any issue in defending until then. Now, the only ones who remained were Namikaze Minato and Uchiha Kashiro. Among these two, he rejected the thought of targeting Namikaze Minato since he came as reinforcements. He would have fewer chances of encountering him. Moreover, Minato usually remained near Nara Shikaku and a few other young clan members who would be protected by the senior members of their clan. So, by the process of elimination, only one remained. Uchiha Kashiro. From the information he had received, Uchiha Kashiro fought on the front lines with a team of three. The other two members of his team were also quite strong, nearly mid chunin or high chunin level. Normally, Kashiro would be fighting while keeping the Shikaku's instructions in his mind. However, when something unexpected occurred like the appearance of an A-ranked shinobi, he would take it upon himself to attack them before they could deal a heavy blow to Konoha or AIM forces. This was a huge boon to Konoha and AIM's forces. Considering all these things, Shimoda Takeo created a plan. From Konoha and AIM's side, they had no inkling of an idea that the S-ranked ninja was about to make his move. So, naturally, they couldn't plan ahead for this situation. Shimoda Takeo came forth on the battlefield and killed two or three attacks with which the IWA shinobi had the advantage of terrain and numbers. Now, as usual, Uchiha Kashiro went forward to combat him. Considering Shimoda Takeo's skill in Earth Chakra, he could empower his whole body in Chakra and even some excellent quality weapons would find it challenging to pierce his body. And it was said that he had a jutsu named Adamantin Fist which would instantly kill a person upon impact. This was the jutsu which had raised Shimoda Takeo's reputation and one of the reasons why he was classified as S-ranked shinobi. Although Achiha Kashiro knew that his opponent was strong, he didn't have a clear idea that this man was the S-ranked shinobi. Just as always, he went forward to fight him. Normally, these A-ranked shinobi would target him. Which was good enough for him. Shimoda Takeo was fighting against Kashiro and frowned when he couldn't land a hit on his target. As if Kashiro knew when exactly he would be hit, he would back away. His movements were nothing short of excellent or maybe coming close to perfection. After fighting for an hour or so, Shimoda Takeo was starting to get tired. He realized that although he wouldn't lose against Uchiha Kashiro if this fight went on, he also wouldn't be able to accomplish his objective. Understanding this, he raised a huge pillar made of earth. Uchiha Kashiro effortlessly dodged it and threw a fireball at Shimoda Takeo. Shimoda Takeo blocked the fireball by raising an earth wall. After the fireball dispersed, he was forced to raise his arm and block a slash from Uchiha Kashiro's short sword. Uchiha Kashiro was coldly glancing at him and empowered his sword with lightning chakra before proceeding with attacking Shimoda Takeo. However, at that moment, he heard a call for help. Moreover, from the voice, he could guess that it was from Uchiha Akemi. In the middle of his attack, he stopped. He turned towards the direction where his other team members were fighting, and his eyes widened in shock when he saw his friend Uchiha Shuji being pierced with a saber, blocking an attack for Uchiha Akemi. The one who had attacked was the A-rank shinobi of IWA. Kashiro remembered fighting against that guy. Just as he was about to fall in grief, he realized that he was in the middle of a fight. Turning his eyes ahead, he saw Shimoda Takeo coming to punch him. Even though he saw Shimoda Takeo's movements, he didn't have the time to dodge it. Gritting his teeth, Achiha Kashiro raised his sword and blocked that punch from Shimoda Takeo. Unfortunately, his sword broke apart into two and he was punched by Shimoda Takeo. But, the sword did manage to lower the power of the punch by a considerable amount so, although Kashiro felt like some of his bones had broken apart, he could still move. After he was punched, he didn't even try to continue his fight with Shimoda Takeo. He rushed towards his comrade. 
he saw Uchiha Akemi surrounded by several IWA shinobi. He knew she wouldn't be able to survive if this goes on any longer. Akemi, jump, he shouted out for her. Although Akemi was disturbed by her friend's death as well, she didn't dare delay upon hearing Kashiro's command. Just as he had ordered her, she jumped up as high as she could. And in turn, Uchiha Kashiro went through a series of hand seals before using, fire release, fire dragon jutsu. A huge dragon of created while Kashiro ran towards Akemi. The fire dragon charged towards the shinobi on the ground. In turn, the A-ranked shinobi immediately used, earth release, earth dragon jutsu. A dragon created out of earth was created and interrupted the flame dragon from harming the IWA shinobi. Achiha Kashiro had expected them to counter this move, so he was already going through the hand seals of his next jutsu. However, in his recklessness, he had forgotten about the S-ranked shinobi after himself. Shimoda Takeo was also moving as fast as he could. He was well aware that Achiha Kashiro's mind wasn't in the right place. This was the perfect chance to kill him. He went through a series of hand seals and subtly used, earth release, earth hand jutsu. Just when Kashiro was about to use his jutsu, he felt an earth hand grabbing hold of his leg before suddenly pulling him into the ground. However, Kashiro flared a bit of fire chakra in his legs to release himself from the earth hand. However, he was late in using his jutsu. And just as Achiha Akemi landed on the ground, her body was stabbed by multiple shinobi from different angles. Akemi! Achiha Kashiro let out a shout. To this, Achiha Akemi simply turned to him and gave him a bitter smile. That expression seemed to stab Kashiro's chest more than anything. He fell on the ground with a distressing feeling looming over his heart. This scene broke him apart. He cursed himself for being weak. For not being by her side? First, it was Shurju, and now Akemi. In just a span of 10 or so minutes, he had lost both of them. Moreover, other than regret, he felt another even fiercer emotion exploded in himself. Rage. Not just rage at the ones who killed his friends, but it was also fury directed at himself. Shimoda Takeo approached Kashiro and smile when he saw Kashiro fall on the ground with. This was the perfect opportunity to kill this brat. However, unknown to anyone at this moment, the pattern in Kashiro's eyes changed from a three-tomo Sharingan to a three-bladed Shuriken. Currently, the only thing revolving in Uchiha Kashiro's mind was regret and rage. Most of it was directed at himself. The regret of leaving these two alone, maybe it was because he wanted to test his power against a strong shinobi. Or was it just excitement? He didn't know the answer. But he understood that those reasons were the cause of death of his comrades. If he had stayed with them, they could have escaped. No. The other Kanoha shinobi would die then. A voice in his mind answered his question. Yet, another voice said that they weren't of the Uchiha clan, why should he care about them? They weren't even related to Kashiro, why should he care about them? As these two voices in his mind were seemingly arguing, Kashiro turned his head at Shimoda Takeo, who was coming forward to stab him. At that moment, a thought entered his mind, maybe I should just die. How could I have thought that I would be able to protect and make the Uchiha clan groan when I couldn't even protect the comrade so close to me? However, as he had seemingly given up on himself, he felt his life flashing in front of his eyes. In those few milliseconds, he felt like he had replayed this life. He remembered things that he had long forgotten. And he remembered his father's words which had been forgotten in the drift of time. He remembered it was during the time his father had visited him when he had experienced his loss in the hands of Senju Araki. The time when everyone in the entire Uchiha clan who had high hopes for him started to show their disdain for him. Perhaps it was because he had lost publicly to the Senju clan member. They hadn't fought against Senju Araki or hadn't even considered how Senju Araki was the bloodline inheritor of the great Senju Hashirama. What they remembered was how their Uchiha clan prodigy lost to a Senju clan prodigy. He remembered training madly after having been shown such disdain. His popularity had grown to the point where he was seemingly in love with it. He urgently wished to reattain it. One time, he was training and his father, Uchiha Kazuma, arrived. At that time, Kashiro was far too distressed to hear anything that his father said, but he reluctantly did hear his words. Looks like he did a number on you. And I don't mean those physical wounds, but that blow on your arrogance. Well, this is also good. 
You have a chance to see the world from another outlook. From the outlook of a loser. At your current moment, you can be said to be reached quite low. Maybe the lowest point of your life. But do you know, the lowest point is quite convenient. It's because you any lower and you will die in this world of shinobi. So, the only way thing you can do is rise? Rise to the point you were before or maybe even far beyond it. Kashiro remembered asking his father, can I really win? Can I really against Senju Araki? Do you really believe it? Realistically, I don't think you can win against Senju Araki. These words from his father had seemingly destroyed any and all hope in Kashiro's heart. But, I can't say I am not idealistic about it. As a father and the head of the Uchiha clan, I do hope you can win against Senju Araki. However, more than that, I hope you grow from this loss. Because only that is how you will become truly strong. This is not even true despair that you are feeling. When you do, you will wish for death. I just hope you aren't swallowed by that feeling at that time and lose your life. I want to die after entrusting the Uchiha clan to you. This is my one wish. After Uchiha Kazuma had spoken those words, Uchiha Kashiro hadn't changed immediately. In the next fight against Araki, he had lost again. However, it wasn't as miserable as his beforehand loss. This didn't matter to the Uchiha clan members though. Many of them looked down upon him even more in fact. But, Kashiro didn't feel that bad. In fact, it was like he could see the world even clearer at that time. And before he realized it, his training started showing results. He felt as if he had evolved. No, not in terms of power. But mentally, he did. Every day, new ideas would appear in his head to surpass himself from the previous day. And during their next match, he had somehow defeated Senju Araki after a close match. This time, the Uchiha clan members who were cursing him for losing against Senju Araki were coming forwards to praise him for his victory. At that time, Kashiro wasn't delighted by their praise. He understood that winning or losing meant nothing. As his father said, growing from the loss, that is the way to strength. And in the current situation, Uchiha Kashiro felt as if he was experiencing what his father had said later. The true despair. He bitterly smiled, this is cruel, father. It's like you are begging me to live for the Uchiha clan even with these regrets. It's like someone is repeatedly stabbing my heart, and you are still telling me to remain alive. You really are cruel, father. He raised his head and stared at Shimoda Takeo. Moreover, he looked into his eyes. Shimoda Takeo was a little startled when he noticed the pattern in Kashiro's eyes had changed. Kashiro opened his mouth, you know, I find it strange that I can't even feel any anger towards you when you are the reason why my friends died. Maybe it's because I pity you. Unknown to himself, new techniques appeared in his head. Amaterasu. He gently called out the name of his technique. He experienced a sharp pain in his right eye, but he didn't care. The main seemed to be soothing him instead. To him, this pain felt like his punishment for choosing to live at this moment. This was good. Meanwhile, Shimoda Takeo was startled when some strange black flames attacked him. They were latched onto his body and were burning him so strongly that he had started screaming in pain. Jay just what is with these flames? They are burning my body even though it's reinforced by a strong amount of earth chakra. Someone use water jutsu on these flames. Shimoda Takeo called out for his allies immediately. Meanwhile, some other people started at Kashiro, who was still on the ground. D. One of them said before jumping towards Kashiro. Kashiro didn't understand why but the shinobis around himself were moving quite slowly. Their speed even seemed quite pitiful. He opened his mouth and once again used the technique, Amaterasu. However, this time, he didn't choose a single target. All the IWA shinobi who were surrounding him were targeted. The pain in his right eye was far beyond what he imagined, but Kashiro embraced that pain. The reinforcements in the form of Kanoha shinobi and AIM shinobi arrived at their location, but they were shocked when they saw a whole group of shinobi were enveloped by black flames. They saw some shinobi using water jutsus at each other to extinguish the fire, but it didn't seem to affect these black flames. And from the middle of this group, they saw a black-haired boy coming out of this group while holding two bodies, one over his shoulder while the other in his arms. The IWA shinobi who were already burning, went to target him. Since they knew they were about to die, then they thought that they must at least kill this boy. 
Kanoha Shinobi and Aim Shinobi were charging at IWA Shinobi to prevent them from harming Kashiro at this moment. However, they were still at some distance. It would take some time before they reached his position. Meanwhile, Achiha Kashiro didn't seem to hate that these IWA Shinobis were coming forward to stab him. Yet, just when they were about to stab him, he would dodge at the last possible moment by sidestepping. Some of them even threw out wide-range jutsus at him, but Achiha Kashiro simply vanished from that spot and appeared at some distance. It was like he hadn't been there at all. Jinjutsu. The answer soon appeared in the mind of IWA Shinobis, Kanoha Shinobis, and the AIM Shinobis. And by the time they were about to target him again, they were forced to fight against the AIM Shinobi and Kanoha Shinobi. Achiha Kashiro had successfully escaped. In this battle, IWA lost 1 S-ranked Shinobi, 4 A-ranked Shinobi, 10 or so B-ranked Shinobi, and many Genins. As Achiha Kashiro returned to the camp, he met up with the commander of the force. It was an AIM Jounin. The AIM Jounin noticed how Achiha Kashiro seemed to have returned even though he had been given no orders. Moreover, he seemed to be holding two bodies. What is the meaning behind this, Achiha Kashiro? Why have you returned from the front lines? No orders have been dispatched for your return. Where are you going while holding the bodies of your comrade? The AIM Jounin was staring at Kashiro with a stern look. I must return to the Achiha clan and bury them. Simple as that. Achiha Kashiro gave a short answer before he started walking. Wait. You can't leave like that. You need to listen to my orders. Kashiro paused, he turned to stare at the AIM Jounin who was shouting at himself. I give you my word that I will return within four days. With that, he simply vanished from the spot. Just as the AIM Jounin was about to order some shinobi to go after Kashiro. A few of AIM Shinobi and Kanoha Shinobis returned from the front line. All of them had a bright smile on their faces. Meanwhile, the AIM Jounin was growing incensed. He had heard that the front line was attacked by the S-ranked Shinobi and some A-ranked Shinobi quite suddenly. He thought that these people had escaped and was naturally growing angry. However, before he even had the chance to open his mouth, a Kanoha ninja said, Commander, Shimoda Takeo, the S-ranked Shinobi, also known as the Iron Hand has died. Moreover, not just him, but several A-ranked Shinobi had died. We don't know what happened, but when we reached the location, we saw several of our own men lying on the ground, the IWA Shinobi burning by some strange black flames while Achiha Kashiro carrying the bodies of his teammates and coming out. At that moment, the AIM Jounin's eyes widened. He looked at the faces of the AIM Shinobi who were right next to Kanoha Shinobi, is that the case? Yes, Commander. The others will be joining us soon. And soon enough, the remaining shinobi from the front lines returned. The AIM Jounin's head finally started working, and he understood this was the work of Achiha Kashiro. Perhaps his actions could be excused in light of this. However, he still didn't dare to make such a decision. It would be better to inform this matter to Hanzo and await his order. And naturally, Hanzo allowed this. He was already quite delighted that Achiha Kashiro had managed to defeat so many IWA shinobi. Allowing him a break from this war wasn't a big deal for Hanzo. By the next day, Achiha Kashiro returned to the Achiha clan. He went to meet the parents of his comrades, who had lost their lives. Although their parents were sad, they didn't say anything to Kashiro. They had seemingly resolved themselves before having sent their children. They were already satisfied that Kashiro brought the bodies of their children. Perhaps their silence hurt Kashiro more than their anger would have. He joined them while they went to bury the two. For half a day, he remained seated in front of their graves, their parents had left, but he remained there and continued to talk. Most of what he had mentioned were his good times with them, and the rest were his apologies. He didn't realize it, but his father had come and was observing Kashiro from a distance. Before Kashiro even had a talk with Achiha Kazuma understood what had occurred. He was more or less aware that it would occur. Whether it was today or a few years later, it was bound to happen. He truly wanted to go over and have a talk with his son. To help him out of this depression, to give him a pep talk, but he restrained himself. He was experienced enough to understand that this was something that his son needed to deal on his own. Whether he would fall or rise would purely depend on him. A helping hand to him here would be a wrong move. For another day, he remained in his house, not at all doing anything. 
not even meeting his father. Makoto was out on a mission, so she also didn't meet up with him. However, the third day was different. Kashiro went to meet his father. It wasn't for advice, but he wanted to inform him about something. Father, I have come to inform you of a few things. Uchiha Kashiro calmly said while gazing into his father's eyes. Kazuma remained silent and let him continue. Firstly, my Sharingan seems to have gone past the three Tomo stage. From what I have read in the clan records, it should be the fourth stage of the Sharingan, the Manjiku Sharingan. Kashiro said while activating his Sharingan and it soon changed to that of the shape of Manjiku Sharingan. Kazuma's expression remained the same. He was calmly staring at his son, waiting for him to continue ahead. Secondly, I will be returning to the battlefield today. This line surprised Kazuma. He didn't think his son would be making this decision so early. Are you sure? Although it will be troublesome, I can explain the situation to the third Hokage. He won't pursue the matter. He paused when he saw a stern look appearing on Kashiro's face. I am sure, father. I finally understood what you meant when you asked me to grow up that day, the time when you consoled me after I lost to Senju Araki. You wanted me not to be affected by winning or losing that much. You wanted me to strive my best and focus on improving myself. However, that wasn't all. A clear look appeared in his eyes, you were also talking about strengthening my resolve. To grow up not just in terms of power but in terms of the heart as well. In these two days, I have been thinking of the various situation of what would have occurred if I had chosen death at the moment just because of my regret to not be able to save my two comrades. If a shinobi of my strength dies, there is a chance that many clan members who I could save in the future would die due to my weak heart. So, father, I have come to an answer. Death is a sweet release? My punishment shall be to do my utmost for the clan and for the people close to me. Kashiro gave out his answer. Kazuma remained silent for some moments before answering, it seems that you have come to your conclusion. But even though the answer you have given me is quite admirable, I will still warn you. You cannot save everyone. Yes, father, but sometimes, one can hope idealistically as well, right? Kashiro asked his father with a small yet bitter smile on his face. Kazuma was a little surprised upon hearing his son's words and nodded, looks like you really have grown up a little from this event, don't die now. A bitter yet helpless smile spread on Kashiro's face, I feel like a great pressure is over my head which is forcing me to live. I don't think I can die even if I want to at this point. With that, he left the Uchiha clan. Meanwhile, Uchiha Kazuma continued to stare ahead before he started chuckling. It was a mixture of happiness and grief. He has broken the curse? Looks like I really can rest assured about the future of the Uchiha clan. He muttered, feeling quite happy within his heart. Kashiro, you have changed the fate of the entire Uchiha clan? And now, even with my clairvoyance, I can't see through what sort of future the Uchiha clan would have. But, at least it will be spared from utter destruction, leaving behind only a single or so descendant. If Uchiha Kashiro had been here, he would have been shocked to see the pattern of his father's Sharingan. Dual-bladed Shuriken was revolving at a very slow speed. Even though he had acquired the Manjiku Sharingan, Uchiha Kashiro didn't show it to anyone on the front lines again. He never felt the need to. He could easily deal with a lot of shinobi without even using his Sharingan. That Tsuchikage received the news of Shimoda Takeo's death. Alongside grieving the death of great shinobi of Iwagakure, he was absolutely angered that someone from Konoha had managed to kill him. Moreover, he heard that it was someone from the Uchiha clan. Someone with that accursed Sharingan. No one in Iwagakure hated the Uchiha clan members more than the third Suchikage. Perhaps it stemmed from the time when he had been humiliated by the legendary Uchiha Madara. Those damn eyes. However, instead of taking revenge for Shimoda Takeo, he pulled back the shinobi station near AIM. There was no need to add more to the casualties. They must conserve their forces for the third shinobi war. Or else, even if IWA and Kumo joined hands and managed to deal with Konoha, IWA would be far too weak to make any further movements. Kumo or maybe Kiri could use that chance to attack them as well. After all, in the world of shinobi, one simply couldn't trust a mere agreement. That would be the peak of naiveness. Almost all the village leaders were aware of this fact. IWA had seemingly pulled back from the front lines against AIM. Hanzo was quite delighted to know of this. 
Now, he could keep the people under him by force even without the support from Kanoha. After all, IWA shouldn't try anything in a short time. Knowing that they wouldn't be fighting for quite some time, Minato had started to meet with more people from Jiraiya's spy network. In this nearly one year or so, he had grasped all of Jiraiya's contacts in the Land of Rain. He had also doubled his time in studying the flying Raijin Jutsu seals and started writing his notes. Uzumaki Aisa would naturally help him out a little here and there, but he let Minato work alone most of the time. Now that one year had come to an end, these surviving Kanoha shinobi were returning while another batch of 100 elite shinobi from Kanoha was going to be dispatched for aim. Hanzo was quite satisfied with this. He told the Hokage that in return of such a favor, he might ask for Hanzo's personal assistance at any time. And Hanzo promised to do everything in his power to accomplish the task given to him. Naturally, the third Hokage was aware of Hanzo, the salamander's pride. He normally wouldn't give out such a promise. But since he had given it out now, he would do everything in his power to fulfill it. A plan formed in his head as he readily accepted this offer. Meanwhile, in Yuzushio, the Tsamazaki clan from the Land of Waves had been given a command. The command was to change the seals around the island. The last time he had given this suggestion to the Uzumaki clan head, Uzumaki Hishin, the man had mentioned that it would take a long time to accomplish that. Now, out of 2,000 or so Uzumaki clan members, 300 Uzumaki clan members would regularly work on the seals around the island. They were changing the routes and also adding quite a few twists on Araki's demand. They had even used clones to increase their work rate, but it still took them nearly one year to change all the seals. He hadn't asked them to work on it before because although the Uzumaki clan had been destroyed, the great villages would naturally get intel from the movements in the wave. If they received intel that 300 or so shinobi were doing something suspicious, it would have aroused their suspicion, and they might have come to check. Perhaps they might have discovered the Uzumaki clan members as well. Although this risk existed right now as well, that was why Araki had personally come to this place. Under his sensing range, any and all spies were ruthlessly silenced. A few innocent people who had seen it were threatened into silence as well. Their relatives were captured and taken into custody. Although Araki didn't want to do this to the people who really were innocent, he couldn't take any chances. He couldn't let the information spread. Not even a single spy managed to send a letter back to their village. Araki guessed that great villages spies in the land of waves were passive infiltrators. These people were living their life normally, and would only contact their respective great village to report some sort of suspicious activity in the land of waves. After all, there was no way a great village would be interested in information from civilian areas like the land of waves. They probably wouldn't even bother for information unless an incident related to shinobi or samurai occurred there. At the most, these infiltrators had informed their respective great village about the sudden appearance of Samazaki clan. But surely nothing else. As for why Araki was sure of this. It was because not a single great village had dispatched their army towards Yuzushio. If they had even a slight inkling of what Araki was doing, they would have dispatched a huge army to destroy Yuzushio before it could be revived. And while they were changing the seals for this one year, Araki had unsealed the ghetto statue in Yuzushio and would send his chakra inside it. He was trying to match the level of his wood chakra with the ghetto statue. It was a rather taxing job for him. The ghetto statue's wood was a lot denser than his own. However, he felt that he was improving the denseness of his chakra at an abnormal rate. Moreover, not just his wood element, he felt that his sensing skill was getting better. Perhaps it was because he had understood how to retrieve his chakra from Ghetto Statue. The Ghetto Statue would seemingly refine his chakra and return it five times purer than before. Every week, he could only do it for a single time. Meaning, within a whole year, Araki had refined his chakra for a total of 52 times. Araki didn't dare to try this out back at Kanoha. In this one year, he had faintly understood that there was a consciousness in this ghetto statue. Although faint, it was still there. After he realized it, he stopped refining his chakra using the ghetto statue. He understood although he gained a lot with this method, he was awakening an unknown consciousness inside of ghetto statue. However, since it hadn't completely woken up, the situation was still good. Now, he needed to keep it sealed as before. This wasn't all he had achieved in this one year though. 
In this one year, he had meditated a lot, one reason was to keep his emotions under control. And the other reason was, he was checking if there would be any improvement of his sensing range or not. Meditation normally helped in purifying the spiritual portion of chakra. Perhaps it would be able to boost his strength even further. With these thoughts, Araki spent a lot of his time meditating. And this one year of meditating was bearing fruit. Even if it was only faintly, he could sense some sort of mysterious energy in the surroundings. Mysterious energy far stronger and denser than chakra, yet, instead of the suppressing chakra, it seemed to give it a boost. So, this is sage chakra? Araki murmured while absorbing that stream of chakra into his body. As the stream of chakra entered his body, he felt a strange battle had started between his chakra in the body and the sage chakra he had just absorbed from the surrounding. He didn't know, but some faint dark marks appeared over his eyes and forehead. They formed rings over his forehead and dark marks underneath his eyes. Araki's concentration soon broke, and the sage chakra was seemingly flushed out of his body. That was an odd feeling. It felt as if I had found the missing part of myself. This energy? It was oddly familiar to that energy I felt when I entered the world of the ghetto statue. As he realized it, a smile spread on Araki's face, Senjutsu doesn't seem hard to control, just denser than chakra. But, still, raising my perception to sense it is quite the challenge. Or maybe is it just because there is a low amount of sage chakra around here? He shrugged at the end of his statement. There was little he could do regarding that. At this time, an Uzumaki clan member appeared. It was a young woman in her early twenties. Araki-sama. As you have ordered, all the seals around the island have been replaced. Should we finally bring all the clan members here? She asked for his orders. Relocate the entire Uzumaki clan which had been in the land of the waves. And. I also give you the right to remove the seals with which you have changed your hair color. From now, you can declare yourself as the members of the Uzumaki clan. As he finished speaking, he noticed the sight of that young woman trembling. Perhaps it was in happiness, excitement, or maybe eagerness, the young woman gave him a complete bow, T thank you, Araki-sama. I will immediately inform them of your orders. Araki acknowledged her bow and soon stood up. He started walking towards the location where the original Uzumaki clan settlement was built. Although the young woman was very eager to inform Araki's order to them all, she still contained that eagerness and followed after him. Araki spoke with a small smile over his face, even though this location had been cleaned in this year, it would be quite troublesome for the Uzumaki clan members to come and rebuild the settlement here. I guess I can lend a helping hand. Before the young woman could comment on it, Araki clasped his head and concentrated for a few seconds. It was taking him quite some time, but soon enough, he opened them and said, would release, four pillar house jutsu. Times 1000. A bead of sweat went down his face as he used this jutsu. For some seconds, nothing happened. But soon enough, the entire island rumbled. It felt like the entire island itself was shaking at this moment. And soon, would suddenly shot out from the ground. The young woman realized that it was not at one, two, or three points. Nearly thousands of wood pillars had shot out of the ground, each one at a particular distance from the other. Each one was moving at a similar rate. The young woman didn't dare to blink while it occurred in front of her eyes. It was as if she was witnessing something majestic. She had naturally seen Araki creating a house for himself using wood release. However, she had never seen a jutsu with such a wide range. Before she realized it, the houses had been created. Well, these should be enough, I guess, Araki said before starting to walk towards the edge of the island. He soon reached the point where the Uzumaki clan had bitterly fought against the army of the three great villages. He recalled some fond memories of his first Kenjutsu master, Uzumaki Takuya. He started walking on water? He was well aware of what route he must take to reach Nami without injuring himself. The young woman soon came after him. She had seemingly come to ask him one last thing, Araki-sama, what should we do about those people who had seen us? Should we kill them all? Aren't you cruel, Miss Rika? Killing them seems a bit too much. Araki asked her with a small smile on his face. Araki-sama, I believe we must not be soft-hearted in this mad dash, she immediately stopped speaking when she noticed Araki staring at her, quite gently in fact. Please punish me for speaking out of turn, Araki-sama. She immediately said when she felt like she had made a mistake. 
In turn, Araki shook his head, killing them gives me a bad taste. To me, these are simply pitiful people who had seen something they shouldn't have. Just bring them on the island and let them live as they want. They shouldn't be able to leave or inform anyone else of this news. After some time, it won't be a big deal in letting them return to the land of waves since I would be declaring the revival of the Uzumaki clan in the whole elemental nations. As you command, Araki-sama, Rika spoke out while giving a bow. She then disappeared by using the body flicker jutsu. After she disappeared, Araki gazed in front before slowly walking, five great villages. I wonder how many will remain by the time I am done? An amused smile appeared on his face as he continued to walk forward. Araki returned to Konoha by the end of the week. It had been nearly a week since Uzumaki clan had completely relocated itself in Yuzushio. Some rumors did spread, but they were related to the fact that Samazaki clan had suddenly disappeared from the land of waves. Because of selling storage seals, the Samazaki clan was quite well known among the people of the land of waves. They couldn't believe this clan had left so suddenly. Araki was sure that all the villages would send their own teams to investigate the cause of their departure. He wondered if someone would be foolish enough to attempt to go to Yuzushio. He wasn't worried about the Uzumaki clan members. He knew that whoever attempted to go to the Yuzushio without knowing the route was just courting death. Moreover, he had left quite a few surprises for censors there. Currently, only a selected few people could hope to forcefully break through these seals and reach Yuzushio. And these people numbered less than 20. Nine of them were the tailed beasts and after them were the kages of the great villages. He didn't really know if the third Kazakage would be able to go past the seals or not, but Araki felt there was no harm in overestimating the man. The Sand Village did like to believe that the third Kazakage was their strongest Kage until now. Araki met up with Kushina. The first thing Kushina did was kiss him passionately on his lips. Before long, Araki returned the passion and broke the kiss. I missed you. I missed you more, Databane. Kushina exclaimed while hugging him tightly. It had been quite some time since he last heard this verbal tick from Kushina's mouth. Araki couldn't help but let out a light-hearted chuckle. What happened here while I was gone? That old man tried to make a move against the Senju clan? Araki asked her while gently caressing Kushina's hair. Kushina shook her head and replied, the third Hokage had in fact been very silent. He didn't even call out for Tsunade. If I didn't know any better, I would think that the old man had given up. That's surprising. I thought the third Hokage surely would have taken advantage of my absence. Well, not that it matters now. In the next few weeks, the situation's tard get to normal. All the great villages were preparing for war. And around this time, Achiha Kazuma had revealed some things to his son. Achiha Kashiro and Achiha Kazuma, only these two were seated in a very silent room. Achiha Kashiro had no idea why his father had called out for him, but he remained silent and waited for him to speak. Son, I think it's time to reveal a few things to you. Firstly, as he said that, the color of his eyes changed. His chocolate black eyes were replaced by crimson color with three tomo in it. Soon enough, the three tomo in his eyes changed into dual-bladed Sharingan. Looking at the pattern, Kashiro's eyes widened in surprise, Father. You also have a Manjikyu Sharingan? In these two months, Kashiro had naturally become more knowledgeable about the Manjikyu Sharingan. He had read some forbidden texts related to Manjikyu Sharingan inside the Uchiha clan. What? You thought only you would have it? An amused smile spread on Uchiha Kazuma's face as he asked his son. To this, Kashiro remained silent for some time, indeed having thought that he was the first one after Uchiha Madara. Well, unlike your Manjikyu Sharingan, I have unlocked some non-combat abilities. Clairvoyance. I can see the events in the future and predict the flow of the future. These words confused Kashiro. Flow of the future? Yes. I concentrate on my decision in my mind and activate the power of my right eye, and it tells me just how it would affect the future. And with the power of my left eye, I can see visions of that event. But, I can only use the power of my left eye once a year. Moreover, it takes my sight in return. Upon hearing these words, Kashiro's eyes widened. What? Father, does that mean you will go blind if you continue using it anymore? Kashiro asked with a rather worried voice. 
Kazuma chuckled upon hearing those words and replied, As of this moment, I am nearly blind. I cannot even see your face clearly. However, looking using the power of my left eye one last time was worth it. I need to inform you of something, son, Kazuma said to Kashiro with a rather serious look in his eyes. Do not interfere with the Senju clan? No matter what the cost, you must never raise your hand against the Senju clan. Kazuma said to Kashiro very seriously. What did you see in your vision, father? Kashiro asked him seriously as well. A fierce war? On one side was the Kumo army, I believe, and on the other was Senju Araki, walking towards them alone. Kazuma said while sucking a breath of cold air. Even though he saw that vision, he still couldn't believe it. He had seen a huge army of Kumo on one side while on the other side was Senju Araki, alone. For some reason, there was no one near him not even the forces of Kanoha. Yet, this was not the complete vision. Near the end of his vision, he saw tailed beasts. All the tailed beasts gathered at one spot and Senju Araki standing in between them. He knew well enough that whatever it was, the Uchiha clan must not interfere or try to infuriate the Senju clan. That? I see. Kashiro knew that his father was probably talking about a vision nearly a few years in the future. For Senju Araki to grow strong enough to confront an entire great village meant that he must be sufficiently strong. It was still quite shocking for Kashiro? He felt as if the difference between himself and Senju Araki was widening. Well, that wasn't a wrong thing to say. Noticing the look on his son's face, Kazuma said, although I cannot guide you towards more power. I can do one last thing to boost your strength, son. My eyes? Take my eyes and implant them. This way, you will gain eternal Manjikyu Sharingan. There would be little to no drawback in using the Manjikyu powers. Only a single man has unlocked this level of Sharingan, Achiha Madara. Kazuma said with a gentle voice. Father? What about you? If I take your eyes, are you planning to implant my eyes into your own to recover your vision and get eternal Manjikyu Sharingan? Kashiro asked with a relatively curious voice. No. It would be far less useful to me. You must keep your eyes safe for future generation. For your son perhaps. Kazuma gave his suggestion with a smile on your face. At this, Kashiro's eyes widened with surprise, and he said, But father. You. You won't be able to see anything. You will live without your eyes. Kashiro. I am not much better than a blind man at this moment. And do you know, I am tired. I am tired of having taken this stressful position. In all these years, never once have I been able to let out a breath of relief. I saw our Uchiha clan's destruction not far in the future. The bitter smile on his face showed just how helpless he was. No matter what decision I made, the result would be the same. Perhaps the destruction would hasten even more. But I finally saw hope in you. Perhaps it was during the time when Senju Araki came to meet me. At that time, I saw a faint possibility of survival of our Uchiha clan. Kashiro, you have gone past my expectations time after time in these years. I will be leaving the clan to you. Kazuma said with a smile that seemed to hold a great pressure. Father? I don't know what to say. I don't know whether I am ready for such a big responsibility at the moment. I feel like I still need a year or so to grow. Kashiro murmured out, seemingly not quite satisfied with himself at the moment. Don't forget that I could see through the flow of the future. Even if I am blind, I can see a bit farther and know you are more than ready. A determined expression appeared on his face as Kashiro decisively said, The time has come, Uchiha Kashiro. Lead the Uchiha clan to glory. And two years before the start of the Third Shinobi War, Uchiha Kashiro became the head of the Uchiha clan. The Hokage and the rest of the clan heads, excluding the Senju clan, Araki was simply amused, were shocked to know that the Uchiha clan had such a young clan head at this moment. But they weren't the only one shocked, even the Uchiha clan elders were shocked. They couldn't understand why Uchiha Kazuma was so hasty in passing over the position of the clan head. They met up with him to discuss the matter and ask him to hold off. And at that time, they saw the Manjikyu Sharingan in Uchiha Kashiro's eyes. The Uchiha clan elders weren't aware of Uchiha Kazuma's Mangikyu Sharingan. They were utterly shocked upon seeing Kashiro's Manjikyu Sharingan. Although it took some convincing from Kazuma, they grudgingly accepted this decision. One reason why they did accept it was because the Senju clan head was Senju Araki and not Senju Tsunade. 
To the prideful Uchiha clan, it was as if the Senju clan members were telling them that the Senju clan trusts their young prodigy to rule the clan while the Uchiha clan does not even trust their own prodigy. They readily accepted this decision. They still had no idea that Uchiha Kazuma also planned to pass on his own eyes to Kashiro and let him unlock the Eternal Man GQ Sharingan. The surgery was performed in secret, and Uchiha Kashiro remained in seclusion for the entire time. Only Mikoto would come and meet him during this time of seclusion. Some elders were given control of the Uchiha clan until Uchiha Kashiro's training ended. Though the clan elders weren't too convinced by the excuse, they still agreed. The third Suchikage of IWA and the third Rakage of Kumo had decided to meet up. They had come in the neutral village of Taki. Although nearer to IWA, Rakage was aware that Taki was independent of Iwa's schemes. They had been given the seven tails by the first Hokage, and they were weak only in terms of numbers. The quality of their shinobi reached the level of the great shinobi villages. Anyway, they were having their alliance meeting. The third Rakage stared at the third Suchikage before speaking, so, I have heard that the S-ranked shinobi under you was killed by an Uchiha brat? It seems IWA is only so and so. The mocking look on his face was quite irritating for the third Suchikage. The people who had joined the third Rakage were here and asking him to not show such blatant disregard for the third Suchikage. However, the third Rakage didn't care. He naturally was happy at Iwa's troubles. Maybe after destroying Kanoha, they could have a chance at IWA. To this, the third Suchikage snorted and replied, You shouldn't show such a delighted look, Rakage Dano. Your ANBU members did die at the hands of Senju Araki when they went to Kanoha. This. How do you know this? The third Rakage stared at the third Suchikage and asked for answers. The third Rakage had been very secretive about this method. You don't need to know that. I am merely informing you that Kumo isn't also as great as you believe it to be. Now, should we get this alliance started or do you want to continue this battle of words? The third Suchikage seemed to be in the mood to get the thing started. He really wanted to hurry up. Whatever. The third Rakage said while taking a seat. His guard stood behind him, taking note of the third Suchikage's guards. Now, let's discuss our strategies ahead. Because if it continues on like this, Kanoha might make it a long war. We won't be able to afford a long-term war against them. The daimyo who have been funding us wouldn't be able to support the war expenditure for a decade or so. The third Suchikage's voice was quite calm as he said to the third Rakage. Tisk. The third Rakage clicked out his tongue but didn't interject. He was aware that this was the truth. Although he didn't fear anyone in a battle, he couldn't say the same about his shinobi. They wouldn't be able to fight against Kanoha shinobi for such a long time. Moreover, he was sure that they were going to fight against Hataki Sakumo, the man who was smart enough to be recognized as a military tactician. Unless that man was killed through some means, it would simply be quite troublesome for the Kumo shinobi. Rakage had internally decided to be the one to fight and kill Sakumo Hataki, the White Fang. However, there presented an issue in that plan. How do we hold back the third Hokage while I fight against Hataki Sakumo and kill him for good? The third Rakage asks with a rather curious look. I will perhaps need to fight against Hanzo the Salamander, so I don't think I would be able to stop the third Hokage at that moment. The third Suchikage said, quite casually. Humph. I expected nothing more from you. The third Rakage said with a hint of irritation and disdain. Before the third Suchikage could respond to him, he continued, I guess I will take care of the two of them. You just make sure to attack Kanoha and deal massive damage to the village. Naturally, I would do that. Now, let's talk about something more serious. The third Suchikage responds to the brute known as the third Rakage. About the Kyubis Jinchuriki and Senju Araki. The third Suchikage's voice was quite grave as he called out for Senju Araki's name. The reason the third Suchikage didn't mention anything about the Uchiha clan was that he had no idea that the Black Flames were due to the Manjiku Sharingan. Although he was surprised to know that someone named Uchiha Kashiro had killed his S-ranked shinobi, he didn't worry about Kashiro too much. Senju Araki. The third Rakage ground his teeth at the very mention of Araki. He still remembered that scene from the time when they had attacked Yuzushio. It was because of the presence of Senju Araki and the Kyubis Jinchuriki that they had encountered the most losses. 
He also remembered that the envoys he sent, returned while informing him that Senju Araki fed the bodies of his ANBU members to dogs. That he considered them no more than dog food. It was enough to ignite the third rakage's fury. Although the third rakage was a brute and rash man, he still knew well enough that he couldn't just charge at Kanoha with the current strength of Kumo. He needed to endure, endure until he could return that favor tenfolds. Now, although the third rakage planned on dealing with the Senju Araki alone, he still didn't know who should deal with the QB's Jain Shuriki. He was sure that if the QB's Jin Shuriki could use the QB's power so good at that young age, her control over it must have vastly improved by now. Well, he wasn't entirely right in his thoughts, but he was on the right track at least. In this one year, it seems that Senju Tsunade has returned to Kanoha, but Orochimaru is nowhere to be found in Kanoha. The third Suchikage informed the third Rakage. Jiraiya, the Toad Sage, and Senju Tsunade, the Slug Sanin, well, even though they are quite strong. I can deal with them. The third Rakage said with a confident tone. You are right, but we still cannot underestimate them. The third Suchikage said with a grave voice, he continued, the last time we did underestimate someone, we paid a huge price. I am sure you remember that battle of Yuzushio. The third Rakage didn't reply, but he clenched his fists in anger. That was nothing short of a humiliating experience for the third Rakage. So, what do you want then? Ask the Mizukage? That was one option? To this, the third Suchikage shook his head, that is a good idea. We can ask the Mizukage after a few years, but not now. I don't think his daimyo would agree to support him in a war against Kanoha from the start. In fact, we will be asking for Suna's support. The third Suchikage finally said. Suna? I see now. Suna lost against Kanoha during the Second Shinobi War. Although they haven't reached the peak of their strength, they would be delighted to enter the war in the middle phase of the war. The time when our two great villages have shaved off Kanoha's shinobi. The third Rakage said, agreeing with the decision of the third Suchikage. At this moment, the attendants of the third Rakage or third Suchikage couldn't help but think at the same time if what they are saying is indeed the truth. Then for the first time in history, a coalition of four great villages would be formed against a single great village. It's quite an ironical situation that the man who split the tailed beasts between the villages for peace, his grandson would be one of the main reasons behind this coalition. Someone of his potential cannot be left unchecked. He must not be allowed to realize his true potential. I will definitely kill him this time. The third Rakage said with a determined look in his eyes. To this, the third Suchikage didn't say anything. He stood up and left Taki. The wheels of time continued to turn. Two years passed by in the blink of an eye. In these two years, many events had taken place. Firstly, Achiha Kashiro had consolidated his position as the clan head within mere months. Originally, the Achiha clan elders thought that if Kashiro was the clan head, they could use their old age and control his actions. But, this was unacceptable for Kashiro. He had personally paid a visit to the clan elders who were against him, and for some reason, after his visit, they would turn brain dead. Now, many other Achiha clan members were aware that Kashiro wouldn't take anything lying down. He would immediately strike, and his strike wouldn't contain any mercy. In these two years, he had ordered a strict training regimen for the Achiha clan members. The training regimen was fixed for a particular age group. Minor alterations were acceptable for some Achiha clan members who could be considered exceptions. Another thing he did was that he created a special orphanage, exclusively for Achiha clan members whose parents had died due to some reason. The child would be allowed to play with other kids in the orphanage and also trained by the caretaker. In this manner, the entire Achiha clan was seemingly changing. The once arrogant clan without much strength to back their arrogance was slowly but surely getting stronger. Achiha Kazuma had started living some distance away from the Achiha clan district. This was his own way of telling that he won't be interfering with the clan matters any longer. However, Kashiro and Makoto would still come to visit him regularly. At least once in two days. Three servants were working for Kazuma, they would answer his needs at any time. Kashiro wanted to give his own Sharingan eyes. But Kazuma had been very adamant in telling Kashiro to save it up for one of his descendants. After Kashiro had acquired the Eternal Manjiku Sharingan, he had seen a vision. It was something which had shaken him up. 
He didn't dare to talk about it with anyone. After all, it was far too terrifying. This was one of his reasons for asking the entire Uchiha clan to train as if their life depended on it. Meanwhile, Jiraiya had gone to the Land of Lightning, and he was following Orochimaru's trail. From what he had found out, it didn't seem as if Orochimaru had made any contact with the third rakage. In fact, the third rakage didn't even seem aware that Orochimaru was present in Kumo. Orochimaru was well aware that no matter what he said to the third rakage, that brute would still attack him. That man had little to no brain for any scheming? He was unlike the third Suchikage who could immediately see an opportunity and act upon it. But, Orochimaru also didn't want to join hands with IWA. Perhaps it was because he held an innate dislike for the Land of Rock. That is why, after figuring out that Jiraiya was pursuing him, Orochimaru fled to the Land of Wind, to the Sunagakir. Although he was surprised how Jiraiya had managed to find him in the Land of Lightning considering he had covered up his tracks, he didn't think about it too much. Jiraiya was quite strange in these kinds of things. He had quite a huge spy network, so maybe someone did find a clue regarding Orochimaru. Anyway, he had great plans for the Sunagakir. The third Kazakage couldn't be said to be an impulsive man, he was an opportunist. Just a little more cautious than the third Suchikage. The war between Kumo and IWA against Kanoha had begun. Their shinobi had already started breaching the borders to attack the borders of the Land of Fire. Meanwhile, the shinobi at the Land of the Fire were relentlessly defending. Although the war had started, all the three great villages were aware of the fact that this was still not the true start of the war. The third Hokage was well aware that IWA and Kumo were just making appearances. In reality, they were using this to take complete authority in their hands. Naturally, the third Hokage wasn't going to be left behind. He also called out for an emergency council meeting. In it, all the clan heads within Kanoha had been asked to come. It was a rule since the Tobarama's time that any clan head who didn't come when the emergency council meeting was announced, that clan would be renounced by Kanoha. After dealing with the war, that clan would face destruction. And, the only clan which refused to enter the meeting was the Senju clan. The third Hokage couldn't be said to be disappointed. In fact, he could hardly hold back a gleeful smile appearing on his face. This was good. This was very good. He now held a chip with which he could threaten Senju Araki. Surely even he wouldn't want to become the entire Kanoha's enemy. Kashiro had attended this meeting, and he saw that Senju Araki hadn't come. He started drawing conclusions about this fact. It seems that the relations between the Senju clan and the Hokage had degraded to the lowest point. Moreover, it seemed that he is staying true to his word. He doesn't even want the seat of Hokage. He is truly letting someone from the Uchiha clan become the Hokage. Although I didn't think of him as someone going back on his word, still, this does surprise me. Knowing that this could be considered a chance, Kashiro was quite interactive in this emergency meeting. He made many points regarding where the Uchiha clan would attack and everything. And ultimately, regarding the Uchiha clan, it was decided that some of Uchiha clan Jounins would lead a team into the IWA borders through AIM and inflict a massive blow on IWA. Now, although the Hokage held complete authority, he naturally wouldn't do something that could sever his relations with any of the other clan heads. Moreover, the Hokage realized that he could use the Uchiha clan to go against the Senju clan. Knowing the rivalry between the two clans, the Uchiha clan should be more than willing to do so. Before this emergency meeting was called out, the Hokage did say, you all should be aware of the rules and regulations of Kanoha. This was an emergency meeting, yet the Senju clan head didn't make his appearance here. Since it's our founding clan, I will be giving them a single chance of apology. If they don't do so, the Senju clan will be renounced by Kanoha and will become our enemy. The clan heads naturally understood what he wanted to say. Although they all held different perspective of this matter, none spoke their mind on this. They were well aware that the Hokage was using rules to justify himself. If someone did try to take the Senju clan side, the third Hokage wouldn't mind purging them as well. In these two years, the Senju clan hadn't changed much. In fact, most of the time was still managed by Tsunade and Kushina. Well, it was because Araki would be too busy meditating. It seemed that he had found the inkling of sensing Sage Chakra and absorb it in his body. Upon hearing that her younger brother was trying to sense Sage Chakra, 
Tsunade thought that it would be best to ask the summons. The slugs in the Shikatsu forest. Although they might not know how to assist the user in learning sage mode, their location should be filled with dense sage chakra. That's how summons chose their habitat. However, Araki was adamant in learning in a world where there was a low amount of sage chakra in the world. He wanted to get used to sensing this pitiful amount of sage chakra and increase his absorption speed. At the Shikatsu forest, his short-term gains might be many, but he wouldn't achieve any long-term gain. There was something else he had been attempting. However, he had found himself failing in that aspect. After having mastered sensing the sage chakra and absorbing it in the stationary form, he tried to do the same while walking. However, he realized that while walking, he couldn't calm down his chakra. So, for the next three or so months, he learned to calm down his chakra completely. Fortunately, he had Tsunade's help in this matter. Tsunade knew several training exercises to calm down chakra since she required it in her use of medical ninjutsu. After having mastered this technique, Araki finally started his training of combining nature energy with his own chakra while walking. It was quite a challenge for him as he needed to concentrate a lot. But he believed this was worth it, he wanted to create a routine of this. A routine so that his body would passively absorb the nature chakra around himself and he could use it at any interval. Moreover, his sensing skill had gotten more detailed. Previously, he still needed the assistance of some trees to help him track down. But now, he felt as if one third of the land of fire, no, half of the land of fire with Kanoha as the center was within his range. Moreover, there was one thing he noticed, every time he entered sage mode, Araki felt as if he had become too powerful. Just far too powerful. That there was nothing, Araki couldn't do. Although he was aware that Senjutsu was powerful, never did he believe that it would give him such an incredible boost. He was faintly sure that if he tried to control the ghetto statue while using Senjutsu, even the ghetto statue would have to obey his commands. He hadn't yet utilized the power of Senjutsu on anyone. It would best be used in war. The time when he would finally confront Kumo. There was also another jutsu he had started to create. It was a little similar to Bijudama. He was planning on naming it Raisingan. Moreover, another thing was, Minato had seemingly come to know of all of Jiraiya's spy contacts in AIM. He was now planning to return to Kanoha. In these three years in AIM, he had also understood the theoretical concept of the flying Raijin jutsu. It took him a lot less time than he expected. But he was well aware that it was only possible because of Uzumaki Aisao. Minato had grown curious about why Uzumaki Aisao was so proficient in sealing. He had come to understand that even before these three years, Uzumaki Aisao had a profound understanding of the flying Raijin Jutsu. Just how could someone understand such a profound Jutsu? Moreover, the sealing knowledge of Uzumaki Aisao far surpassed Jiraiya. It was as if Jiraiya's claim of being a seal master was just garbage. Minato was naturally thankful for Aisao's help in these years. He planned to return the favor by always protecting Uzumaki Aisao from harm. Now that three years had passed in aim, he was considering returning to Kanoha. Beside him was Uzumaki Aisao? Minato had taken it upon himself to escort Aisao back to Kanoha safely. While they were returning, Aisao suddenly turned his head in the right-hand direction and ran off. Minato didn't really understand why he was running in that direction, but he immediately used body flicker jutsu and followed him. Maybe he found something? Finally, they reached their destination. The two were hiding behind a house. Minato didn't understand why they were hiding. He was about to ask Aisao when he noticed a strange look in Aisao's eyes. It was as he was happy yet confused. Aisao mouthed out to Minato, making sure not to release his voice, I will activate the sound barrier seal and chakra concealment seal. Don't take any action until then. To this, Minato responded with a silent nod. It took just a minute or so for Aisao to activate both seals. After having activated the seals, he said to Minato, something is going on here. The Amakage, Hanzo is here and a huge group of shinobi are here. Let's check it out. Minato didn't ask Aisao how he knew of this information. He trusted him well enough and slowly peeked at the location. There he saw, Hanzo, standing on top of a raised platform. There was a lot of shinobi beside Hanzo. All of them were staring at a considerably smaller group of shinobi standing on the ground. This smaller group was wearing dark cloaks and with red clouds over these cloaks. 
They numbered nearly 20 or so. Meanwhile, the shinobi around Hanzo numbered 100 or so. Isao managed to sense them was because of his sensing skill which he usually activated when traveling from one region to another. Although the range wasn't too large, it sufficed. Today, he had sensed a familiar chakra from someone here. As he peeked out from the sides of the house, he stared at all the shinobi there. He wondered just which one would give him a familiar feeling. And it didn't take him long to figure out. He found a redhead among the guys standing on the ground with dark cloaks and red clouds. Due to his familiar chakra, and those striking red hairs, Isao was nearly 70 to 80% sure that this guy was an Uzumaki. They looked up above and saw Hanzo staring at the group while releasing his killing intent. Yahiko. You are the leader of this Akatsuki organization. In these years, your organization has taken care of civilians in AIM, saving them from the effects of war. This was the reason why I approved of your organization. However, in these recent years, I have heard reports that the members of Akatsuki have attacked my men. Tell me what I should do with your organization? Hanzo said while staring at the guy named Yuhiko from the Akatsuki. Your men were extorting those poor civilians. No. Not just extorting, they were committing atrocities. I commanded my men to merely punish who took things too far. Yuhiko replied fiercely. Although the boy appeared to be young, he didn't seem to back down at all. Akatsuki? Minato muttered with a low voice. He had indeed heard the name of this organization in AIM. More times than not, people would be praising the actions of the Akatsuki. But, they were quite secretive. Even Jiraiya's contacts had little idea about where to find them. But it seemed that Hanzo was aware of their hideout. He had even called out for almost all the Akatsuki members here. Yahiko, Nagato Uzumaki, and Konan, these three were 14-year-old at this moment. The three had become war orphans during the Second Shinobi War. Their parents had died to either IWA Shinobi or Konoha Shinobi. Between these three, Nagato Uzumaki spent the most time with his parents. But unfortunately, they were killed by Konoha Shinobi. And, because they were war orphans, they knew the pain of losing loved ones due to war between the great villages. They quickly became friends after they met. It was Yuhiko among them who proclaimed his great ambition to bring peace to AIM. The other two were a little amused when he proclaimed it. They knew how much of a braggart their friend was. But internally, they also wished to bring peace to AIM. So, they decided to help out their friend with this. When they were six years old, they had the chance encounter of meeting the three legendary San Nin when they were returning after their defeat at the hands of Hanzo. During that time, Jiraiya had stayed behind to train them. Perhaps it was because he took pity on them and wanted these war orphans to have some means of protecting themselves. With those thoughts, he trained them for one year, teaching them basic ninjutsu, taijutsu, and jinjutsu. Jiraiya saw the Rinnegan in Nagato's eyes and was quite shocked. He had never heard of an Uzumaki awakening the Rinnegan. Moreover, this was a dojutsu of the legendary sage of six paths. As he heard of the naive ideas of Yahiko, he even found himself thinking that perhaps these three could indeed bring peace. There was also the prophecy told to him by that old toad stating that he would teach the child of prophecy, who would either bring destruction or peace. Believing that the inheritor of Rinnegan, Uzumaki Nagato might be that person, he taught him quite earnestly. Only after the three were capable of defeating his shadow clone did he leave them in aim. Since that time, nearly five years had passed. In this time, they had slowly formed a group as Yuhiko helped out more people in Amage Cure and spread his idea. Slowly, people started giving them support, whether it was in terms of whatever money they could give or blessings. These people had also grown tired of relentless wars that the great villages waged. AIM hadn't even been in any direct conflict with any of the great villages, yet the people suffered simply because it was normally the site of war. The Akatsuki had been taking missions, amassing a certain amount of wealth and aiding these civilians who couldn't protect themselves. Hanzo had even supported this organization, believing that it would lead to peace within his land and everyone would obey his order. However, recently, he had been hearing how people hadn't been giving him taxes. When he sent his men over, it seemed that the members of Akatsuki protected these people. It wasn't just in these days. This had been happening for a couple of years now. However, he had to deal with other urgent matters, whether it was to continue checking out IWA, or the diplomacy talks with the Hokage. 
He simply couldn't be bothered to deal with Akatsuki at that moment. He had sent one of his men to the Akatsuki headquarters, stating that they should show restraint. However, the same thing happened again. It seemed as if his warning had fallen upon deaf ears. Moreover, he had also heard rumors of how the public wished for the Akatsuki to rule the village. Although no one was openly rebelling against Hanzo's authority, Hanzo was sure that the seeds had been implanted. If this continues, the public would surely rise up against him. For that reason, he had asked for their presence right here. He was planning on giving them a final ultimatum. To hear his order or face annihilation at his hands. Now, as for the Akatsuki members. All of them were struggling, wondering what they do. They knew that the shinobi standing beside Hanzo was quite strong. Even if Yuhiko, Conan, and Nagato somehow managed to keep Hanzo occupied, they still wouldn't be able to deal with these shinobi. Not only were they massively outnumbered, but their skill was also worlds apart. Moreover, after having heard their leader's fierce words to Hanzo, they had prepared themselves for death. And at this time, Isao said to Minato with a low voice, Minato? I want to know about that red-headed guy. Can you come with me to talk to Hanzo? For some moments, Minato had to think. He was wondering just who could this red-haired guy be for Isao to want to know about him. All right, let's go. Considering that Hanzo has an alliance with Konoha, he shouldn't attack us. Minato having made up his mind slowly started walking towards this group. Isao followed him while pulling out a strange kunai from his storage seal. He was clutching that kunai quite strongly as if prepared to defend himself the moment situation turned dire. Hansama, please stop. Minato's voice did gather their attention. Almost all the shinobi turned to his direction, all of them wondering what this guy wanted. Hanzo was standing at a higher ground, so he merely turned his neck a little and saw Minato and Isao. He was wearing a mask, so it was hard to see what his expression was. He spoke with a neutral tone, Namikaze Minato, the apprentice of Jiraiya. What do you want? Speak quickly. I am dealing with an internal matter of Amage Cure. Upon hearing that Minato was the apprentice of Jiraiya, three members of Akatsuki stared at him curiously. He was the apprentice of their Jiraiya sensei? Minato nodded his head while he responded, my acquaintance here wishes to ask something from this person. He pointed at Nagato while telling Hanzo. Hanzo raised his brows, but he didn't understand what Minato wanted. He stared at the youth behind Minato and saw it was some uncharacteristic person. That youth was seemingly affected by the auras of Shinobi targeting the Akatsuki. Hanzo concluded that he was quite weak. Isao mentally calmed down as he turned towards the Akatsuki members, M. Can you tell me your name? Yes, the one with the red hair. Me? Nagato was somewhat confused for some moments that Isao was talking about him. And Isao gave a nod in confirmation, yes, please tell me your name. My name is Nagato. Nagato gave out his name a little roughly. Isao frowned a little before he asked Nagato, your full name? Or are you not aware of it? Although it confused Nagato even more, he replied with somewhat proudly. My name is Uzumaki Nagato. After hearing those words, Isao's eyes widened, and the kunai nearly slipped out of his hand. Even Minato was shocked to some extent. This man was an Uzumaki? The one from the clan which had already faced extinction. Hanzo didn't even blink his eyes. It seemed that he was aware of this fact. He was also aware that this boy didn't possess any sealing jutsu, so it didn't matter if he was Uzumaki or not. A warm smile spread on Isao's face as he said to Nagato, So, you are an Uzumaki? It seems I had the right idea. Come with me, Nagato. You don't need to stay here any longer. I will lead you to a safe place. Come with you? Nagato, Yahiko, Conan, and Minato seemed to have muttered at the same time. Not just that, Hanzo and some shinobi near him frowned. It was as if this boy was ignoring their presence while taking away their target. Well, they weren't wrong about that, this was indeed happening. Meanwhile, Nagato curiously asked Isao, What do you mean by going with you? I don't even know you. And I also have no idea where you are going to take me. Why would I come with you? Besides, I won't be leaving my friends here. Not in this situation. I am Senju Isao. I am from the Senju clan of Kanoha. I am asking to take you away is because you are an Uzumaki. The Senju clan head, Senju Araki is willing to give asylum to all the Uzumaki clan members around the world. He will protect you from anyone. 
Isao started speaking, and before he realized it, he had spoken quite a lot. Minato frowned a little, although he was aware that Araki would be willing to bring the Uzumaki clan members to the Senju clan manor, he didn't know if this would be alright to speak in this situation. Hanzo was clearly intending on punishing these Akatsuki members. Minato didn't know if Hanzo would allow Nagato, even though he was an Uzumaki to get away. Nagato was somewhat surprised to hear this. He asked Isao, I, don't trust in your words. Moreover, even if what you have said is true, I won't be leaving my friends behind Dash, before Nagato could finish his words, Yahiko shouted out, he will go with you. What? Nagato turned towards Yahiko, clearly surprised by his shout, I won't be leaving you all her Dash, however, Yahiko came next to him and whispered, from Hanzo's words a bit earlier, he may want to kill us all to make sure that Akatsuki's roots are burnt. But, if you can survive, you can lead the Akatsuki, carrying on my ambition. To bring peace to the whole world. No. I don't want peace in which you two don't exist. Nagato fiercely said to Yahiko, making his priorities known. Nagato, this is your chance. I want you to survive. If you survive, all my work will have been worth it. Akatsuki would have meaning only if someone survives, and you are the one getting this chance. Do not let it go. Yahiko spoke, seemingly pleading Nagato. Nagato still remained adamant though. He wasn't going to budge from this spot without the two of them. Nagato, Yahiko is right. I think you should listen to him. The most logical one between them spoke. It was naturally Conan. Seeing his two friends pressuring him so much really didn't help Nagato's condition. At the same time, Isao saw how attached Nagato was to his friends. He thought, he is an Uzumaki, alright. It would be impossible to convince him to give them up. Should I also bring them over? Araki-sama shouldn't care much as long as they aren't enemies. The troublesome one is. Hanzo. Indeed, at this moment, Hanzo was staring at Isao and Minato. He spoke to Minato, Namike's Minato? What is the meaning behind this? You think you can take away someone who is to be punished by me? Naturally, Minato was a little confused by what he should do. But, he was sure that he couldn't abandon Isao here. Since Isao had spoken, Minato needed to respect his words. It wasn't just because Isao was a fellow Senju clan member and Araki would give him hell if Minato returned without Isao. It was also because, in these three years, Isao had helped him out a lot. The two of them have become a very good friend that Minato trusted Isao with almost anything. Since Isao was the one who wanted to bring away Nagato, Minato was going to stand by his side. As Isao has said, the Senju clan head has been very clear in his statement that he wants to find all the Uzumaki clan members and protect them. Minato said with a clear look in his eyes, I will request you to let Uzumaki Nagato come with us. Hanzo didn't show much of a reaction to Minato's words. But he was clearly hesitating, whether he should let Nagato go or not. You are all wasting your time here. As I said before, I won't be leaving my friends or my comrades behind. If they are to be punished, I will take that punishment as well. Nagato said quite loudly and clearly. It seemed as if he had made up his mind. At that moment, Isao spoke, All right then, bring them all with you. They can all come to the Senju clan with you. Not just the Akatsuki members, Hanzo's men and even Minato were completely shocked at those words. Minato had a bit of bitter smile as he wondered, Isao? You are normally so calm. So why are you making the situation even worse this time? Taking away a single person was still fine, but Hanzo won't let go of them all. Hanzo's eyes showed a trace of anger. He didn't even stare at Minato this time, straight away looking at Isao, you boy. You have some nerve. You want to take them all away right in front of me? Who do you think I am? I sincerely apologize about this Hanzo-sama. I have no intention of showing you any disrespect. However, it seems that only if I take them all will Uzumaki Nagato follow. I have no choice but to offend you for this. You can ask for compensation from Arakisama, the Senju clan head. Isao naturally understood the graveness of this matter. He had no choice but to use Araki's name. He didn't know if it would be worth it to offend Hanzo for a single Uzumaki, but he still couldn't abandon one of his own clan members here. The Senju clan head? You think you can take them away while using the name of that brat? Not even Jiraiya or any other Sanin's name would suffice. You are from Kanoha, so I am letting you live, do not impinge further on my generosity. 
Now get away. Hanzo gave his order loudly. Minato felt a strong pressure hit his body, but he remained there, not at all moving. Meanwhile, Aisao's eyes had a cold look in them, he muttered, Brat? You think of Araki-sama as a brat? I am telling you one last time, go away. Or else, I won't show any mercy. You would be buried underneath aim and no one will find your corpse or will know if you were here. Hanzo said to Aisao and Minato, making it clear that he wouldn't hesitate in targeting the two. You will kill me? You? A small smirk appeared on Aisao's face as he seemed to be asking Hanzo. It was strange for Hanzo to see this pitiful boy who had been trembling just a little while earlier. Even Minato whispered to Aisao, Aisao? I don't think Hanzo will be using words any longer. He will really go through his words. We should get away while we can. I don't think Araki will appreciate it if you put your life on the line for some unknown person. Aisao shook his head negatively. Meanwhile, Yahiko, Conan's shoulders dropped. It seemed as if Nagato really wouldn't be able to escape. Yahiko was even planning on attacking Nagato and make him unconscious before handing over Nagato to Aisao. With this, he could rest assured of Nagato's life. But, it seems that Hanzo had no plans of letting them go. This really was quite bad. Hanzo. Try repeating those words again. Aisao said before he sent Chakra in his kunai and threw it some distance away. The kunai hit the ground and seemed to be embedded in it. The shinobi around couldn't understand what Aisao wanted to do with it. If he was attacking, that was quite a pitiful aim. However, at that moment, many of them noticed a seal on the kunai. Suddenly, someone appeared next to that kunai. It was quite an unfamiliar person to them. Minato's eyes widened upon seeing him, and Aisao merely smiled. Hey Rocky! Minato spoke out, unable to believe that he had just witnessed teleportation. Moreover, this was something quite similar to the second Hokage's flying Raijin Jutsu. Did this mean that Araki could use the flying Raijin Jutsu? He never knew about this. Upon having come, Araki's first words were, Hmm? Why have you called out for me, Aisao? He picked up the kunai while turning towards Aisao's direction and asked curiously, ignoring everyone else around them. Araki was quite confused when he received a signal of help from Aisao. He was taking a walk around the clan manor while absorbing the senjutsu. There was a seal on Aisao's kunai. If Aisao sent his chakra through this kunai, it would alert Araki shortly before summoning him there. Although the application was quite similar to the flying Raijin jutsu, the one who was using this jutsu was in reality Aisao. Half of the concept of this seal was also based on the reverse summoning jutsu. Aisao stared at Araki and briefly explained the situation to him. Hanzo, the Akatsuki, and even Minato continued to stare at Araki, wide-eyed and dumbfounded. Well, Minato was flabbergasted because he had a wrong idea. But the same couldn't be said for the others. Who are you? It was naturally Hanzo who asked this question. He had never once seen Araki in his life, so he didn't know how he looked like. Araki ignored Hanzo and instead stared at Nagato, so, you are Uzumaki Nagato, huh? As Nagato found himself being stared by Araki, he unconsciously sent Chakra in his Rinnegan, seemingly preparing it to use a Jutsu. He didn't know why he felt such pressure from Araki when the latter hadn't even shown off his aura yet. Yes. I am Uzumaki Nagato. And before you speak what Aisao has said, I won't be leaving without my comrades. I would rather die than leave them behind. Nagato said strongly, leaving a strong impact on whoever heard his voice. To this, Araki started chuckling, well, if I do want to take you away then you can't die even if you want to. But still, since you want to take your comrades with you, alright, let them come along as well. His gaze turned serious as he said, however, I won't allow them to enter the Senju clan manor. They will be given another residence where they can live temporality before I make any further decision regarding them. Huh? What? Almost all the Akatsuki members couldn't help but be shocked at Araki's words. This youth, who seemed not much older than their leader, was telling them to come with him. He hadn't just ignored Hanzo's question, he had also started to inform them of what would occur after he takes them away. Was he that confident in leading them away from here? And at the same time, Hanzo spoke, his voice growing colder and louder, I asked, who are you? A tremendous amount of aura hits Araki's body? It was as if Hanzo wanted to use his aura to intimidate Araki. Whatever his plan was, it failed miserably. 
Araki cocked his head to the side and stared at Hanzo. Um, your aura misses some points with the third Hokage. Anyway, you have been asking for my identity, I guess it would be rude not to comply. He turned his body to the Hanzo side and said, the Senju clan head, Senju Araki greets you. Senju Araki. Almost all the shinobi around Araki except for Aisao and Minato blurted out. They were aware that Aisao had called out for some sort of helper for himself. But they didn't anticipate that he would call out for the Senju clan head himself. So, you are the Senju clan head, huh? Let me tell you, Senju Araki, I won't be letting these shinobi go dash, Araki seemed to have ignored Hanzo's words once again as he said to the Akatsuki members, hmm? Why are you still standing there? Didn't I tell you that I would bring you away? Do you want me to beat you all up and take your unconscious bodies to the Senju clan manor? B but Hanzo-sama is right here. One of them spoke while pointing at Hanzo and his shinobi. It seemed they feared him quite a lot. Hanzo. Danzo. Kanzo. Whatever, it's the same thing really. If they stand in my way, I will turn them into corpses. Araki said, quite casually. But the thing was, the shinobi around him couldn't be casual about this. Hanzo's eyebrows twitched uncontrollably. This was the first time he had met someone speaking such words in front of himself. Not even the third Hokage would dare to say these words. Almost all of them were thinking, heavens. This clan head is so daring. He dares to speak such words in front of Hanzo-sama. Meanwhile, Yahiko was looking at Araki with an awestruck expression. This was precisely the level that he wanted to reach. He didn't know why, but he had a feeling that as long as this person protected them, even the god would have to back off. Quickly making his decision, he ordered, everyone, go to Senju Araki's side. We will be going to Konoha? Although a little surprised by their leader's orders, the Akatsuki clan members immediately complied. Hanzo gave the signal to his shinobi. And almost all of them attacked at the same time. Some of them were using water jutsu, fire jutsu, earth jutsu, and even the lightning jutsu. Fire release, great fireball jutsu. Water release, water bullet jutsu. Earth release, great boulder jutsu. Lightning release, lightning arrow jutsu. These series of attacks targeted the Akatsuki members immediately. Each of these jutsus was used by at least 15 or so shinobi. So, although these jutsus were ranked quite low, they had combined with each other and formed strong jutsus. Strong enough to kill most of the Akatsuki members as long as they struck them. Yet, at that moment, wood suddenly started to grow from the ground near them. Wood walls formed around them in all four directions which protected them from these jutsus. Araki turned his head towards Hanzo and said, I am willing to ignore this if you back away right now. Or else, not a single one of you would have their body intact. Is that a threat, Senju Araki? Hanzo spoke out, getting riled up as Araki asked him to back away. Not even the Sanin can ask me to back away. Who do you think you are dealing with? Hanzo said before finally making his move. He used the body flicker jutsu to quickly cross the distance between himself and Araki. To this, Araki let out a sigh, truly a fool? But I guess I can't expect you to back away unless I show you a hint of my power. Hanzo was in front of Araki, and just as he was about to swing his Kuzurigama at Araki, Araki raised his finger and stopped the Kuzurigama with his single finger. A shockwave occurred which seemed to crack the ground around them. Araki raised his brow and said, is that all? You couldn't even make me bleed. Truly disappointing. Before Hanzo even understood what happened, Araki grabbed his face and slammed him on the ground. Hanzo was grabbed so tightly that he couldn't even use the body flicker jutsu or substitution jutsu. However, while he was slammed down by Araki, he saw some markings on Araki's face. The markings which he hadn't seen before. Araki had a frown on his face as he looked at Hanzo, that was a little weaker than I expected. I guess I held back more than I thought. But still, it's a good thing you didn't die. I can't let Amagekure become a village without Akage just yet. You still have a role to play in this war. After that, Araki picked him up while grabbing onto his face and throwing him away. He said to Hanzo Shinobi in that direction, take care of your Kage. Don't let him make any more rash movements. He could die, you know. With that, he turned towards Nagato and the other Akatsuki members who stared at him with wide-eyed looks. At this time, even Hanzo Shinobis didn't dare to shoot out any jutsu at Araki. 
They were rushing towards Hanzo and checking if he was fine or not. As Yuhiko walked to Araki's side, he asked him, are you really going to save us? Yuhiko was aware that Hanzo had quite a lot of authority. He could even ask the Hokage to tell Araki to hand over the Akatsuki members since it was AIM's internal matter. The Hokage wouldn't want to anger Hanzo over such a matter, so he was naturally going to agree. It could become quite a bit of troublesome situation for Araki. But, Araki replied while shaking his hand, don't worry about these small matters too much. The markings over his face had disappeared. It was as if they were never there. Perhaps, only a few shinobi other than Hanzo had seen those black markings before they disappeared. It didn't matter to Araki if they had seen it or not. Even if they did, it's not like they could relate it with Sage Mode. And by any chance even if Hanzo did relate it to the Sage Mode, it wouldn't matter. Araki believed himself to be strong enough to deal with anyone in the world. But, there was something he figured out from that small fight against Hanzo. Even after using Sage Mode, his physique wouldn't be able to compare to that of the third rakage. There was still some distance between them. If he used Senjutsu, his reaction speed and strength might be above the third rakage, but his physique wasn't as good as the third rakage's. Well, it mattered little. Araki wanted to crush that man's pride. He boasted of his invincible body, right? Araki planned on tearing it apart into small pieces, slowly and then feed it to the dogs. Well, fortunately, he still had a year or two left to simply work on his physique. He tried to keep his dark thoughts under control as he led all of the Akatsuki members, Minato, and Aisao to Konoha. Many of the Akatsuki members were reluctant to leave AIM. It couldn't be helped since they had been born in this place and grown up here. They wanted to first lead AIM to peace, but it seemed it wouldn't be possible at the moment. If they remained here, Hanzo would just target them again. Meanwhile, for some time during their journey, Yuhiko, Konan, and Nagato didn't talk to Araki at all. Instead, they were talking between themselves. Yuhiko said to Nagato with a small smile, looks like you have somehow managed to save us. I didn't do anything. I still don't know why the Senju clan head would come to protect me. And not just that, he even offended Hanzo just to protect us. Nagato truthfully replied as he truly had no idea. Conan said with a small smile, it's a good thing he appeared though. I don't think any of us would have walked out of that encirclement alive. I guess. Yuhiko let out a nervous laugh as he remembered that close call. It was as if fortune blinked on them. So, who will go and ask Senju Araki of the reason why he saved us? I think it would be better to get it out of the way. It was Nagato who asked this question. I am the leader, so I guess I will ask him. Yuhiko decided to be the one to ask Araki about his intentions. During their next break, Yuhiko approached Araki while Nagato and Konan followed him closely. Um, my name is Yuhiko. I wanted to ask you something, Senju Araki-sama. Yuhiko said to Araki, who had been thinking of something at the moment. Hmm? He let out a sound in question, alright, speak. And also, just Araki is fine. Alright, Araki. Yuhiko was a little uncomfortable by the only calling in Araki. Still, he placed it in the back of his mind, why did you want to save Nagato? Or even us? Do you need his assistance or something? Araki raised his brow in question. At that moment, understanding struck him like a thunderbolt. He shook his head and responded, not really. I wanted to save him because he is an Uzumaki. Simple as that. And since he couldn't leave you guys, I figured bringing you all would be better. I personally know how stubborn the Uzumaki clan members are. You know other Uzumaki clan members? Yuhiko was excited upon hearing that. Did this mean Nagato still had his family? Araki was a little taken aback by his excitement. He wondered why this kid was getting so excited. It's not like it was his own family. Araki indifferently shrugged, my grandmother was Uzumaki Mido so I can be considered part Uzumaki. Besides, my wife is also an Uzumaki, so you can already consider two Uzumaki here. He naturally wouldn't say tell him that all the people in the Senju clan manor were also Uzumaki, including Aisao. Even Nagato's eyes widened in surprise. He never thought he would see someone from his family again. A few years ago, he had heard of the destruction of the Uzumaki clan. At that time, he did hold a bit of interest in going over to the Uzumaki clan, but, it was suddenly attacked by the three great villages and annihilated. 
Just thinking of it made him clench his fists in anger. His own parents were killed by Kanoha Shinobi. His clan was destroyed by the three great villages, it was like this whole world was rotten to the extreme. So, hearing that he could find meet some of his clan members, Nagato was beyond happy. Hello! Nagato came out of his hiding position and greeted Araki rather politely. Conan decided to follow him as well. Hmm, I was wondering when you were going to appear from your hiding place. His words surprised them, they were quite sure of their concealment skill. Did he still manage to sense them? Don't think of it too much. I am a sensor. No matter how good you are, you can't hide from me. Araki told them quite casually. Nagato and Conan understood, they nodded their head before walking next to Yuhiko. It was at that moment did Araki's eyes locked with Nagato's eyes, and he raised his eyebrow, ho, purple eyes with ripples. Is that the Rinnegan? Araki asked them a bit naturally and noticed that the three of them stifled upon hearing his question. After some time, Nagato replied with a heavy voice, yes, these are known as Rinnegan. At least that's what Jiraiya-sensei called these eyes. Jiraiya-sensei? You are Jiraiya's students, huh? I keep getting more surprises out of you three. Araki had a small smile on his face as he said to them. The three of them kept on staring at Araki, wondering what he was going to do. Seeing their tensed expression, as if they were ready to fight or flight, Araki couldn't help but chuckle. You are too tense. It's not like I have anything against you three so relax a little. Araki told them to relax while waving his head. This. You really don't want Nagato's eyes, right? Even though these are the same eyes held by the sage Dash, before he could speak any further, his mouth was forcefully shut off by Conan. She whispered to him quickly, stop being stupid. Since he doesn't want it, then don't give him reasons to take it. It would be good for us to hide some things. Hm? These are the identical eyes to the Sage of Six Paths, yeah I know that. You don't need to suffocate poor Yuhiko for that. At this, the eyes of the three widened, how did he know of that? Did they give away far too much information? Araki responded to their unspoken question, I know someone who had personally seen the Sage of Six Paths in his life. He mentioned the details of Rinnegan to me. So, it's natural for me to know of this. And don't worry so much, the only thing I want to do is fight him when he has mastered those eyes. Perhaps the fight against the legendary Rinnegan would just be enough to make me serious. A smirk appeared on Araki's face as he seemed excited about the prospect of facing these legendary eyes in a battle. After having talked with Araki, the three went over to Minato's direction. They were a little curious about him considering he was the apprentice of their sensei. Minato noticed them and greeted them with a smile, Hello, I am Namikaze Minato. It's nice to meet you three. I am Yahiko. Yahiko spoke his name with a hint of excitement in his voice. It was certainly strange to know that he was the leader. Conan, Conan stated her name a little indifferently. And I am Uzumaki Nagato. Nagato was keeping his face neutral. Minato did notice his eyes, but he didn't know about the Rinnegan, so he didn't think much of it. Other than the fact that Nagato's eyes were strange. Hanzo said that you were Jiraiya Sensei's apprentice. Is that really true? Where is Jiraiya Sensei at the moment? Naturally, it was Yuhiko who asked this question. Minato's eyes narrowed at the words Jiraiya Sensei, and he asked them, Jiraiya Sensei? You are also Jiraiya Sensei's students? Yes, Jiraiya Sensei taught us for three years during the Second Shinobi War. We are very grateful to his teachings. It was Nagato who replied to Minato's question. Jiraiya Sensei did? That's awfully kind of him to have taken some time out of his research and teach someone. Minato replied with a blank expression. To this, Nagato and Conan groaned, recalling the memories of their self-proclaimed super, pervert sensei. However, Yahiko's eyes glinted with a strange light, he he he. I remember when he was peeping on the ladies bathing in the hot springs, and I shouted out for the ladies claiming that an old pervert was peeping on them. Jiraiya sensei was beaten really badly. Minato internally winced as he wondered just how much beating Jiraiya had taken. But it was strange how the beatings would do little to change his character or habit. It was practically mind-boggling. With that, the three continued to talk about each other, sharing their experiences. Minato kept the part of joining the Senju clan a secret from these three. He simply mentioned that Aisao was helping him learn a seal. Meanwhile, Aisao met up with Araki. 
The first thing Isao said to Araki was an apology, I apologize, Araki-sama. I know I made an impulsive decision back then since Nagato is in Uzumaki. I am willing to take on any punishment regarding this trouble. Araki merely rolled his eyes, that can't be called trouble. Well, it can. But not for me. So don't worry about it too much. Go say sorry to the third Hokage for that. Besides, since you all people like to think of yourself as family, it would have been stranger if you didn't want to help him out. You made the correct decision, Isao. Araki gave him a smile. And just as Isao was about to speak something, he was forced to swallow those words as Araki added, it makes me happy that you called out for me when the situation turned dire. If you hadn't, perhaps you would have been imprisoned or died. Even if I had taken revenge for you by turning the entire aim into a graveyard, it still wouldn't have been enough compensation. The words spoken by Araki were said in such a gentle yet confident tone that he immensely believed in his own power. It seemed he was optimistic in destroying the entire hidden village of rain if he really did show off his full potential. Isao understood what Araki wanted to say and let out a sigh. It seemed that he was worried about nothing. With that, the whole group returned to Konoha. Although Yamanaka clan members felt the appearance of some strange chakras entering Konoha, they also sensed Senju Araki's chakra. From what they could sense, these people were being escorted by Senju Araki. It seemed that there wouldn't be an issue. The Yamanaka clan didn't have bad relations with the Senju clan, they could always ask about it later. With that, the Akatsuki members were given a residence a little close to the Senju clan manor. Every Akatsuki member, including Nagato, was asked to live there. Although as an Uzumaki, Nagato could indeed come to live in the Senju clan manor. His appearance could cause a disturbance among the Uzumaki clan members. He had kept the fact of Uzumaki clan for so many years. This was still not the correct time to reveal it. After all, not even Tsunade knew that almost every Senju clan member was an Uzumaki clan member. When she asked why they all had such profound sealing knowledge, Araki mentioned that Uzumaki Hizen had provided him with quite a lot of sealing books and other things. He had given it to the clan members, and they had enhanced their knowledge of sealing quite quickly. Although Tsunade wasn't entirely convinced, she didn't pursue this matter any longer. Araki was going to mention about Nagato only to a few Uzumaki clan members in secret. Perhaps some of them might know of his parents, and if they did, well and good. And if they didn't, well, not his problem. He was going to reveal it to all the Uzumaki members secretively, making sure that Tsunade doesn't get a hint of it. Well, even if she does, it's not like she would do anything. But he believed it would be better to keep it hidden from Tsunade. Anyway, as he met up with Kushina, she asked him a little curiously, where did you go? I couldn't sense you in the area even when I used Kurama's negative emotion sensing skill. You think I have negative emotions in me? Ah. My wife hurts me with her cruel words. Araki jokingly said to her with a smile. To this, Kushina simply snorted in response, even that fox gets scared of the hatred in your heart. At that moment, Kushina heard an angry yell in her mindscape, stupid brat. I don't get scared. You want to fight again? Kushina replied to with equal fierceness any time you want. I will make sure to tear you apart with my chains this time. It seemed that their rivalry had undergone a great change. Kushina wanted to train and fight against some people and who better to fight than the nine-tailed beast? So, poor Kurama would be bullied by Kushina and her chains. Provided he could suppress her as well, but if he used more than a particular amount of power, the seal would break, and he would get out of Kushina's body quite forcibly. Kushina told Araki that Kurama was shouting at her and said to him that he probably wanted another beating. At this, Araki couldn't help but laugh out loud. Every time he visited Kurama, his interactions with Kushina would make him laugh a lot. Araki slowly stopped laughing and then said, All right Kushina, the time has come. Hmm? What do you mean? Kushina asked with a rather curious voice. It's finally time to free Kurama, Araki said with a decisive tone. At this, Kushina and Kurama's eyes both widened at the same time. Kurama wanted to take control of Kushina to ask Araki, are you serious? I am finally going to be free. The location to free Kurama was something Araki had long thought of. It was the very same location where Danzo had died, and his subordinate's life force was used to grow trees Kurama was growing excited. This was the moment he was waiting for all this time. 
Although he didn't feel that bad while staying within Kushina Seal, he still wanted to experience freedom. It had been decades since he was sealed. It was natural for him to desire to be free. After reaching the location, Araki stared at Kushina with a gentle gaze, and he said to her, All right, let's start now. Kushina gave him a nod before she placed her hand on her own stomach and strongly thought, 8 trigram seal. Open. With that, the world around Karama started to change. He felt a strong suction power pulling him out of the body. Kushina started to feel pain in her stomach region. It was like this was going to tear apart her whole body. Araki controlled the 300 or so trees and started to transfer the life force into Kushina's body. This life force reduced her pain to a rather low level. And slowly, reddish chakra started to release from her body. Araki used his other half of chakra to control this reddish chakra and give it form at some distance away from them. It would be rather embarrassing if Kurama condensed right on top of them and they died to its weight. Kurama could feel Araki's chakra, guiding it to some location. And Kurama felt it at that moment. Araki's chakra was seemingly guided by some mysterious energy that seemed to suppress Kurama completely. In fact, Kurama felt that he wouldn't be surprised if Araki could somehow control Kurama's movements just by controlling the flow of chakra. This utterly shocked him. It was worth noting that even Senju Hashirama's chakra was unable to control the movement of Tailed Beast Chakra. If he was capable of that feat, he could have broken the Kyubisusanu union from inside. Kurama could feel it, although Araki hadn't surpassed Senju Hashirama in terms of the quantity of his chakra, the denseness of his chakra did surpass him he shivered a little thinking of that terrifying move, the move which had strongly suppressed the union of both Susanu and Kyubi. If Senju Araki was also capable of that move then who in this world could stop him? As Kurama started to take form, his wild and corrosive chakra started to spread all around. Perhaps even a sensor far away from their current location would have been able to sense Kurama. To counter this, Araki released more of the life essence from the trees nearby. Although his chakra was quite strong, it wasn't that vast that he could completely suppress Kurama for a long time, so he utilized the life essence to hide Kurama's chakra. After nearby a few minutes, Kurama's massive chakra was completely condensed. His form as a nine-tailed fox was complete, and he gave a large grin to Araki. It was worth trusting your promise. He said with that grin on his face. Araki didn't turn to him. He was walking towards Kushina and used his chakra to heal her of her injuries. After that, Araki turned towards Kurama, you are free now. I have completed my first part of my promise. The second part of my promise to you was that no human would be able to capture you in the future. I will accomplish that after this war. After the war? What are you planning to do? Kurama was curious about what Araki was planning to do. How was he going to accomplish that part of his promise? Araki didn't give him an answer, he took Kushina away from that place. While they were returning, Araki said to Kushina, Kushina? Act completely normal after what I am going to tell you. I have brought back an Uzumaki from Amage Cure. Kushina's eyes widened a great deal. She didn't think that Araki brought back an Uzumaki. It was quite rare for an Uzumaki to leave the village. But she still continued to listen patiently, his name is Nagato Uzumaki. It seems that his parents left the Yuzushio for some reason that he isn't aware of. And, he seems to possess Rinnegan eyes. What? Rinnegan eyes? Isn't that the same as Sage of the Six Paths? I have never heard of an Uzumaki awakening Rinnegan eyes, databane. Kushina started speaking immediately as Araki informed her of this fact. Yeah. I know of that. However, it is a fact that Nagato's eyes are the very same Rinnegan as the Sage of the Six Paths that Kurama told us of. Araki thought for some moments and continued soon enough, Kurama told us that the Sage of the Six Paths' power was split into his two sons. The younger received his body while the older received his ocular powers. As he said that, Araki's eyes were slowly growing colder, Achiha bloodline which has the Sharingan. Senju bloodline which has the superior chakra and physique. Their combination should be the Rinnegan. The powers of the Sage of the Six Paths. For Nagato to have activated his Rinnegan, it means that he has the Uchiha as well as the Senju blood within himself. I can still think of the Senju blood considering that Uzumaki clan is known as the sister clan to the Senju clan. But, it's a low probability that he is related to the Uchiha clan in any manner. 
If he indeed was related to the Uchiha clan, he would have awakened his Sharingan first. From his description, it was as if he suddenly came to possess the Rinnegan. Araki explained it to Kushina as his voice started to grow colder. Kushina was a little confused about why Araki's voice was getting colder. What do you want to say, Araki? She asked him rather curiously. Now comes the important part. Araki took a deep breath before continuing. This could all be the schemes of that old man known as the Sage of the Six Paths honestly, considering that Karama and other tailed beasts were formed by splitting the ten tails into nine parts. Why did the Sage of the Six Paths split them into nine parts only? Moreover, although these nine tailed beasts are somewhat difficult to capture, my grandfather was able to capture almost all of them with relatively little trouble. He could freaking give away the tailed beasts as if they were nothing. I don't think Madara would be far off that state. Even if not capture them all, he could still manipulate them at the same time. And if he could control the ghetto statue during his peak state, he could just revive the Jubi. Araki's explanation only served to confuse Kushina. But Araki wasn't done, the sage of the six paths, if my guess is right, he wanted someone to capture all the tailed beasts and acquire the power of ten tails. I don't know for what reason the sage of the six paths would want that. If he didn't want that, he could have split the power of ten tails into thousands, no, millions of parts. No one in the world would have been able to gather them all even if they were immortal. Another possibility is that. This Rinnegan is somehow related to Madara. I remember that during the time when we killed him, he didn't have his eyes. If Madara is indeed the true possessor of the Rinnegan, it would explain how he could summon the ghetto statue from the moon and even control it. Araki's voice was a little grave as he said that. He was well aware that this could be troublesome if Madara was indeed the true possessor of Rinnegan. Although he was quite confident about his own strength, against that man though. He couldn't be sure. What should we do then? Kushina asked Araki with a bit of worried tone. For now, I want to gather more information. And the best place where we can find more information is the Uchiha clan. Alright, you should return to the Senju clan for now. I will go to the Uchiha clan. Uchiha Kazuma or Kashiro might be willing to tell it to me. Araki said to her. Although a little reluctant, Kushina understood that this wasn't a matter in which she should interfere. She nodded her head and replied with a smile, All right, I will meet up with Nagato. Don't worry, I won't say anything about the thing we have talked just now. Araki nodded his head and said, Got it. And remember to take some other members with you. Maybe they might know of Nagato or his parents. Achiha Kashiro? He had expected a lot of things for this day. But a meeting with Senju Araki was not one of those. It seemed as if even his clairvoyance didn't alert him about this. Since Araki had appeared in his home, Kashiro understood that he wanted to talk of something serious. They were in the main hall where people rarely entered without prior appointment. And as far as Kashiro was aware of, no one would come today. Why have you come to here, Senju Araki? Kashiro asked while his eyes unconsciously changed to that of the three Tomo Sharingan. Currently, he felt a massive pressure from Araki. The pressure was so great that his Sharingan activated on impulse. Araki merely smiled upon seeing his Sharingan, aren't you a bit too serious for our meeting? I just wanted to talk to you about something. Even though Araki said this, Kashiro still didn't deactivate his Sharingan. He merely nodded and said, alright, speak. I wanted to know if the Uchiha clan has some records from the Sage of the Six Paths. Some kind of message or text? He asked with a rather casual tone. Why do you want to know of that? This was the first question from Kashiro's mouth. Naturally, it's my own secret. So, the question is, will you tell me about it or not? Araki asked him straightforwardly. Kashiro remained silent for several seconds, as if thinking of something, all right then, I will lead you to the Naka Shrine. The location where we keep our secret records. Heh? Secret records, huh? Aren't you worried that if I know of this location, I might steal or even destroy it? Araki asked him a little curiously. Kashiro felt a lot different than before. The last time he had met Kashiro, he could see a lot of naiveness in his eyes. Yet now, it felt as if he had transformed. Currently, Araki felt as if he was talking to Achiha Kazuma. It was just his intuition telling him of this. Kashiro replied to Araki's words, If it was anyone other than you from the Senju clan, I wouldn't have believed him. But you. 
I know you don't plan on harming the Uchiha clan. If you did, the Uchiha clan wouldn't exist at this moment. Araki raised his brow and wondered. How interesting. It's like he knows of my true power and perhaps even the sage mode. A few Uchiha noticed Araki walking with Kashiro. However, before they could say anything, a glare from Kashiro seemed to silence them. Araki was quite curious about this change in Kashiro. But still, he didn't ask it since it wasn't that important to him. The more important things were the records left behind by the Sage of the Six Paths. As they reached the Naka Shrine, Kashiro suddenly turned towards Araki. He spoke, send you Araki if you wouldn't mind, I want to know the difference between the two of us right now. Difference between the two of us? How do you plan to find that out? Do you want to compare our chakra? He asked with a small smile on his face. No. Let's get inside. I will tell you how I will gauge your power. Kashiro said to Araki, who followed him with a shrug. Soon after they entered a hall where the secret meetings of the Uchiha clan took place, Kashiro took a seat as the head while Araki took a seat as a guest. Kashiro looked at Araki, and the pattern in his eyes changed. Now. Instead of three Tomo, Araki saw pentablated Sharingan. Araki's eyes widened slightly as he spoke, Manjiku Sharingan? This was somewhat out of his expectations. Yes, and now, time for me to test you. Prepare yourself, Araki. Kashiro said, giving a warning. Araki smiled at the moment and said, I did want to test myself against a Manjiku Sharingan. It seems I can fulfill this wish of mine today. All right. You can attack me at any time. With that, Araki had seemingly left his body without any guard. This action confused Kashiro a little, but he resolved himself and said, Very well then. Here I go. Tsukuyumi. Araki had continued to stare into his eyes, and before he realized it, he was in a different place altogether. A red moon in the sky which seemed to paint the whole sky with blood-red color. The world was of a different color than what Araki knew of. Genjutsu. Oh? Araki said before lowering his neck and realized that he was tied to a metal T-shaped thing. This is not simply a Jinjutsu. It can be considered another reality. In this world, I am a god. Every single thing in this world, including time, is in my control. So, tell me, Senju Araki, how will you deal with this? Kashiro's voice resounded in the entire realm of Tsukuyumi. Meanwhile, hundreds, no, thousands of swords appeared and moved to stab Araki. Araki's eyes widened upon seeing them. Before Araki could even blink, thousands of swords were piercing his body. He coughed out some blood in this world of Tsukuyumi. Such an illusion? I can't believe this illusion is so real. Araki was utterly shocked. This was the first time he was experiencing such a fierce genjutsu after all. But, this was not due to despair. No, Araki was quite excited for some strange reason. This is your Manjiku Sharingan's technique, right? Araki's voice remained calm even though thousands of swords were piercing his body. The swords were disappearing, and his wounds were healing. Yes, came the voice of Kashiro. Do you know, I really do love this technique. In fact, I feel like stealing your Sharingan just to get this technique. Araki said with a crazy smile on his face. Kashiro didn't comment on this. He was quite indifferent regarding this fact. Araki continued though, if I do have this technique, I will be able to torture the third rakage without worrying about his death. Just the best. As he said that, his chakra started to overflow from his body. The ropes which were binding him to this metallic T-shaped body broke apart. Kashiro was somewhat surprised when he noticed this and said, it seems you can control your body to some extent in my Tsukuyumi. But still. What will you do? You can't get out of here. Araki shook his head again, if it was the same me as three years ago, then I would have agreed with you. But, right now, even this level of illusion cannot bind me. Suddenly, Kashiro felt his Tsukuyumi trembling a little. The trembling seemed to be getting stronger over time, though. What are you doing? Kashiro asked with a hint of worry in his voice. Tsukuyumi. This world is indeed created by you. All the laws of this world are in your control. The only thing you can't control is me since I am a foreign body. That's why you needed to bind me, right? Araki received no answer to his question, but he guessed that he was right. By nature, Tsukuyumi is also a Jinjutsu. Albeit a powerful one, it's still a Jinjutsu. Meaning, you are somehow controlling my chakra. 
So, I am going to fill this world with so much chakra that it shatters apart. I wonder which is greater, this world of Tsukuyami, or my chakra. With that, Araki gritted his teeth and summoned more of his chakra. Ha! Huh. Kashiro was growing worried at this moment. He never expected someone to break a part of his Tsukuyami in this manner. And soon enough, he felt cracks appearing in his world of Tsukuyami. Before the situation escalated, he cancelled out Tsukuyami, and the two returned to the real world. It was so sudden that Araki couldn't stop his action of flaring his chakra. Cracks appeared in the hall of the Naka Shrine. The ground and the ceiling crackled before, and Kashiro couldn't help but be pushed back by the pressure of Araki's chakra. He used his own chakra to resist it. After the two had tested each other, Kashiro led Araki to the underground floor of the Naka Shrine. This was the location where the Uchiha kept their secret texts. Ignoring the texts related solely to the Uchiha clan, Araki followed Kashiro to a stone tablet. Kashiro said to Araki while pointing at the stone tablet, this is the stone tablet left behind by the Sage of the Six Paths for the Uchiha clan. It was quite a huge tablet and pretty much blank to Araki's eyes. His eyebrows twitched at the moment, and he sarcastically said, what a great message left behind by the Sage of the Six Paths. Kashiro didn't get his sarcastic tone and thought he was serious. He though Araki could actually read it without a Sharingan. Araki stared at Kashiro's face for some time before he realized this dumbass didn't even get his sarcasm. He said, are you really messing with me? It is pretty much blank. Where the heck is that message from the Sage of the Six Paths? Oh. So, you really can't read it. Kashiro even nodded at the end of his statement. That was more appropriate. If someone could indeed read it even without a Sharingan that would be weird. Even Uchiha's without their Sharingan couldn't read it. Kashiro narrated what it said to Araki, it says, seeking stability, one god was divided into Yin and Yang, these opposing two acting together obtain all things in creation. Kashiro was somewhat surprised when he saw another line of text. He hadn't seen this text before. It seemed that this must be because of the fact that he unlocked Manjiku Sharingan. Araki noticed the surprise in Kashiro's eyes and said, and? What else does it say? Kashiro thought there was no harm in mentioning it to Araki, it also says, when someone who possesses the power of Sasra approaches the moon, and I will open that is reflected on the moon to grant the eternal dream. Araki's eyes widened at that statement as he thought, Samsara? That must mean the power of the Sage of the Six Paths, meaning the Rinnegan and Jubi combined. And an eye reflected on the moon? That seems familiar? Is it similar to that thing I saw in Jubi's mindscape? That red-colored moon? That moon seemed similar to the Nine Tomo Sharingan. An eternal Tsukuyumi over the world? Does that mean the user will be able to control all their dreams? Kashiro muttered with a low voice. Araki raised his head and saw some signs of understanding appearing in Kashiro's eyes. He somewhat understood what Kashiro was thinking of. A god was divided into Yin and Yang, meaning the Uchiha and the Senju. It means that you can get the power of the god once again by recombining these two once again. Araki said to Kashiro with a low voice. Kashiro had the same idea. Araki internally thought, is this how Madara got the idea of using my grandfather's cells to become the most powerful? Why would the sage of the six paths write the way to acquire his own powers on the Uchiha stone tablet? Did he want someone from the Uchiha clan to reach his level of power? And then the last question in his head, and where is that black Zetsu, right now? That question brought a frown on his face. With his sage mode, his sensing skill had boosted by a considerable amount yet, yet Araki couldn't find him nearby. Just where was the black Zetsu at the moment? Senju Araki, have you accomplished your objective? Kashiro asked him rather neutrally. Araki thought for some time before nodding. He really was done here. As they were walking out of the Naka Shrine, Araki suddenly glared at Kashiro with a cold look in his eyes, Achiha Kashiro? If you do dare to take the cells of any of the Senju clan members, whether dead or alive, I assure you, the Achiha clan would be buried that very same day. And believe me, when I say, I will know if you have them or not. Kashiro nervously gulped down a mouthful of saliva before nodding. He unconsciously used the power of his right eye, the eye which showed him the flow of future. In that future, he saw that the Uchiha clan had completely vanished with not a single descendant. I, I give you my word. This won't ever happen. 
Not at all hesitating, Kashiro promised Araki. Humph. Araki started walking towards the Senju clan manor. The next day, Araki and Nagato were in the Senju clan's training ground. Araki was instructing Nagato on how to control and train his elements. This was because he wanted to see the power of the Rinnegan. Just how powerful were the eyes of the Sage of the Six Paths? It was said that the inheritor of Rinnegan could master all elements in the world. This fact seemed to be true as Nagato's chakra affinity seemed to be perfectly aligned with all the five elements. But, combining them and using them as bloodline limit was quite challenging for him. Even with Araki personally instructing him, he couldn't use Mokutan at all. Moreover, although his chakra was strong, it seemed far cry from his own, whether it was in terms of quantity or quality. Araki felt that even before his chakra was refined by the ghetto statue, his chakra was still stronger than Nagato's chakra. This only proved that this Rinnegan wasn't Nagato's Rinnegan. It was implanted by someone, and the only person who could implant it would be Madara, or perhaps that black Zetsu. The most Nagato could use the Rinnegan was to enhance his elemental control and attract and repel things, and lastly absorb chakra. Though he had quite a control over the attraction and repelling things, it still wasn't enough to please Araki. As for the absorption, it seemed that he could absorb chakra but not the physical mass of the Jutsu. This was far from sufficient for Araki. Is it possible that he can't use it perfectly because he hasn't truly activated it? Are the condition like Sharingan where the user has to feel some sort of excitement or trauma to activate it? Araki wondered in his head. It might be possible considering it was the evolved form of Sharingan. So, he decided to test this theory. For that, he knew he had to call on for Kashiro's help. Although he didn't want to tell that person about Rinnegan, it was necessary at this moment. He had to know of the Rinnegan's powers or else he wouldn't be able to plan ahead. Kashiro wouldn't make any decision which would be harmful to the Uchiha clan. But if he did make a decision against Araki, it wouldn't be that hard for Araki to silence him. Kashiro was surprised to meet Araki once again. Kashiro, I want to ask for your assistance. Naturally, I want you to keep this matter a secret. Araki said to Kashiro, waiting for his response after that. What do you want? Kashiro curiously asked Araki. Come with me. I can't speak of it here. And I mean only you must come. Araki said before he started walking out of the Uchiha clan district. Once again, the Uchiha clan members were surprised to see Araki here. It was rare for him to come to the Uchiha clan district regularly. Soon enough, Kashiro reached the location where Araki usually trained Nagato. Currently, Nagato seemed to be resting as his body leaned against the tree. Araki said to Kashiro in a low voice, for some moments, Kashiro's eyes remained widened. It was like he had heard something utterly unbelievable. But soon enough, he nodded his head. All right, I will give it a try. But still, I didn't expect you to come to the Uchiha clan for this reason. So you have already found someone with a Rinnegan, huh? Less talking, more work, Araki said to Kashiro before pushing him in Nagato's direction. Kashiro's steps were completely soundless, and he soon approached Nagato's sleeping body. He raised his arm and gently opened Nagato's eyes. Seeing that purple rippled pattern in them surprised him, but a determined look appeared in Kashiro's eyes. The eternal Manjikyu Sharingan was activated, and Kashiro muttered, Tsukuyami. This was so sudden for Nagato that he couldn't even understand when this Jinjutsu started. It was completely unknown what sort of nightmare Kashiro was showing him. Still, even in the real world, Nagato's expressions were changing to some frightening looks. And merely two seconds had passed when Araki and Kashiro felt a monstrous chakra being released from Nagato. The Rinnegan in his eyes seemed to have shown for a couple of seconds before it returned to normal. Kashiro coughed out some blood as Nagato had forcefully broken apart his Tsukuyumi. This was the second time he was meeting someone who had broken apart his Tsukuyumi. But he could understand this. It was broken apart by the inheritor of the Rinnegan after all. As Nagato stared at Kashiro and Araki, he seemed to realize that what he earlier experienced was all an illusion. However, he still couldn't believe it and asked Araki, Araki-sensei, that was an illusion, right? Yahiko and Conan are safe, right? His tone sounded quite desperate. Araki merely turned towards Kashiro and asked him, just what did you show him? Kashiro shrugged in response and whispered, the death of a few people close to him. That's the best trauma. 
I also awaken my Manjikyu Sharingan with that. Regret and rage are fuels for activating the eyes. Araki then turned towards Nagato, how about you use the jutsu that's coming in your mind? We can discuss this all later. Nagato wondered what he meant, but there was indeed a jutsu that he wanted to use. He quickly made some hand seal and said, summoning jutsu, ghetto statue. Araki's eyes widened in shock upon hearing the name of this technique. And not just that, in the Senju clan manner, the vase in which the ghetto statue had been sealed using 13 strong seals slowly started to break. In merely less than 4 seconds, the vase shattered and the ghetto statue was summoned in the training ground. The ghetto statue was summoned right behind Nagato's body. Just as the ghetto statue was summoned, black receivers extended from its abdomen. They pierced Nagato's back, draining some blood and his life force for this summoning. Araki entered the sage mode and shattered those black receivers before they could absorb any more of Nagato's blood and life force. Meanwhile, for some unknown reason, Kashiro activated his Susanoo against this ghetto statue. He was getting an eerie feeling from this thing. His red-colored skeleton Susanoo formed around his body, protecting him from any unknown attacks. W what the heck is this? Kashiro asked, utterly shocked. Even Araki somewhat stumbled. He didn't expect Nagato to straight away summon the ghetto statue. He thought Nagato would be using more of that gravitational powers or awaken some other powers. This was troublesome. I don't know what this is. It seemed awfully related to the Rinnegan since only a Rinnegan user can summon it. Araki casually answered Kashiro's question. Naturally, he won't be telling him of the whole story. Fortunately, Kashiro bought this explanation. He said to Araki with an urgent tone, we need to seal it. This. I am getting some really dangerous feeling from this thing. On that, we can both agree. Araki agreed with Kashiro's words before he turned towards Nagato, I guess this is enough for today, Nagato. Go meet up with your friends, they are fine. The thing that you saw previously was a test, and it has confirmed my suspicions. Nagato didn't completely understand what he was talking about, but he immediately wanted to see his friends at the moment. He was still feeling some pain in his back because of those chakra receivers. Just before he left, Araki placed his hand over his head and sent a lot of his chakra in Nagato's body. The chakra started to heal his wounds, and soon enough, Nagato had recovered completely. Alright, go now. With that, Nagato left the area. Kashiro stared at Araki and asked, should I leave as well? I don't think you need my assistance in sealing the ghetto statue. Araki let out a sigh, wondering if he should even reseal it or not. Considering what he had just seen, a Rinnegan user could easily summon it if he sealed it in a lifeless object. Even some of the strongest Uzumaki seals weren't able to prevent it. But this event did confirm something for him. Madara was indeed the one who summoned the ghetto statue. I thought that the Sage of the Six Paths had lied to Kurama and others and actually kept the ghetto statue in the Elemental Nations and Madara somehow stumbled upon them. Still, it seems that the Sage of the Six Paths might have really left the ghetto statue on the moon. Now, the only thing that remains is to know whether this Rinnegan is of Madara or the schemes of the Sage of the Six Paths. And what is the Black Zetsu doing right now? Why can I not find his location? With the Sage Mode, I am capable of sensing even the movement of shadows, yet I have failed to find him in my range. Araki then stared at the ghetto statue, the husk of the Jubi. He was struck by an idea as he thought, there is actually one way I can keep this thing safe even from the Rinnegan user's hands. Let's see if it works or not. Araki gathered a few Uzumaki members and brought them to the training ground where the ghetto statue was covered by a thick wooden dome. These members were the same ones who had previously sealed the ghetto statue in the vase. Araki informed them of his final plan, and almost all the members there opposed it. Araki's new plan was, to seal the ghetto statue, Jubi's husk, in his own body. A slash N, the reason he was sure it could succeed was that much stronger seals could be used to seal ghetto statue into living things instead of non-living things. Currently, while Araki was dealing with the Rinnegan, ghetto statue, and other things. The whole Konoha was under military rule. As the third Hokage wielded absolute authority right now, he didn't hesitate in enlisting many shinobi of the prestigious clans to the borders. Hataki Kakashi, the son of Hataki Sakumo, the White Fang of Konoha. He was currently five years old. A young age for someone to be graduating from the academy. 
Currently, he was assigned to the borders near IWA while his father and mother were sent to the borders near Kumo. It seemed that Kanoha was truly on the ropes for them to be stationing mere children under the age of six on the battlefield. If this was known to the founders of Kanoha, they probably wouldn't have created this hidden village system. Instead of destroying the wars, this action had taken the wars to just another level. Currently, although Kanoha was at war against IWA and Kumo, they still hadn't pulled out any big moves. The third Hokage was well aware that this wasn't the time to go on the offensive. It was to build up and let these young shinobi grow? Only when they managed to increase their numbers would they have a chance in this war. And while he was dealing with IWA and Kumo, the third Hokage didn't forget about Kiri. The chances of Kiri allying with IWA and Kumo were not a lot, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to send them gifts and maintain good relations with them. Kiri hadn't responded to any of these diplomatic gifts. They were simply strengthening their defenses while maintaining neutrality. This was already quite good for the third Hokage. This was all he expected from the third Mizukage. And the next problem the third Hokage encountered was, none other than Hanzo. From Hanzo, he heard that Senju Araki had somehow teleported to the Amigekure and taken a small organization named Akatsuki under his wing. This was somewhat out of his expectation. From what Hanzo had told him, it seemed that Araki had come to take away an Uzumaki clan member. Moreover, he took all the Akatsuki members just as an addition. Although the third Hokage wasn't pleased with this move of Araki, he understood his character well enough. Araki could indeed make a move against Hanzo with such reasons. The third Hokage sent 60 or so shinobi to aim on the condition that they will remain under Hanzo's orders for the next decade. Hanzo could order them to do anything other than attack Kanoha. This was enough to calm down that man. Although the situation was resolved, the third Hokage couldn't let out a relieved breath yet. He felt like he had underestimated Senju Araki. Senju Araki had grown strong enough to even shrug off Hanzo. The third Hokage felt a significant threat from Araki. He was no longer as confident in dealing with him. But he wasn't that worried? If worse came to worse and Senju Araki did raise his hand against Kanoha, the third Hokage was prepared to take him down with himself. This was all that the third Hokage was aware of. He was still not aware of Nagato's Rinnegan or Kurama roaming free in the land of fire and most importantly, the fact that Araki had sealed the husk of Jubi in his own body. Perhaps no one in the world was aware of these three facts. Currently, in Sunagekyur, Orochimaru was having a meeting with the third Kazakage. The third Kazakage was curious about why the snake Sanin of Kanoha would be in Sunagekyur. Moreover, it was quite strange that Suna's shinobi managed to find Orochimaru. Although he didn't doubt the excellence of his shinobi, he was well aware that finding Orochimaru was a little beyond their capability. This meant that the snake Sanin wanted to be found. But for what reason? Currently, Orochimaru was locked in a prison cell underground the village of Suna. His cell was quite special as they made sure he couldn't use chakra here. This was something even their seal masters were capable of. Orochimaru though didn't appear to be worried. There was a mysterious smirk on his face even as he was in this place. It was the third Kazakage who spoke first, alright, you must talk now. Why did you appear in Suna? Have you betrayed Kanoha and become a missing ninja? This was naturally one of the only possibilities that the third Kazakage could think which would force Orochimaru to come here. Is there even a need to ask this question, third Kazakage? Or do you think I am here to spy? Orochimaru continued to talk with that smirk on his face which seemed to be annoying the third Kazakage a little. With your skills, that might be possible. After all, the third Hokage has still not listed you as a missing ninja. The third Kazakage informed Orochimaru while coldly staring at him. This fact didn't surprise Orochimaru one bit. In fact, this was entirely within his expectations. Sensei is quite intelligent. He doesn't want the world to know that I have broken all relations with Kanoha. He wants to keep on the facade that the three Sanin are reunited. Just like in the second shinobi war, we will display the power of our near-perfect teamwork. Orochimaru informed the third Kazakage with a smirk. Then why did you leave Kanoha? Leaving Kanoha doesn't seem to pose any benefit to you. The third Kazakage asked, a little confused at Orochimaru's words. This question did make Orochimaru frown. In fact, he shivered for some reason. 
He remembered what he had seen during the time when he went to see Danzo. I appeared in Suna to meet you and convince you to attack Kanoha. With that, Orochimaru gave his reason for coming here. For Suna to attack Kanoha at this moment? If that was what you wanted, why didn't you meet me stealthily? For a ninja of your rank, it shouldn't be impossible, right? The third Kazakage asked with a confused expression. To this, Orochimaru merely smiled and asked, Tell me, Kazakage Dano, would you feel assured if I stealthily arrived to meet you? The only way you can even remain calm while talking to me is because I am behind these chakra ceiling bars. The third Kazakage got angry at those words and flared his aura at Orochimaru, Orochimaru. Don't go past your limits. Don't think for a moment that I am scared of your power. I can defeat you any day. Orochimaru shrugged off the pressure on himself and said, Indeed, you are stronger than me in terms of chakra and maybe experience as well. But, if I want to kill you, I have multiple methods. Do you dare to try, Kazakage Dano? Now, this was where the third Kazakage stopped retracted his aura. Although he didn't know how Orochimaru would achieve what he had claimed, it would be quite the foolishness to accept that dare. The third Kazakage knew that betting against someone of Orochimaru's caliber was pure foolishness. He even had a faint idea that Orochimaru could leave this prison if he so wanted to. Why do you want me to attack Kanoha? The third Kazakage finally asks this question from Orochimaru. It's because I am not safe in that village. If I remained there, I would have sooner or later lost my life. With the assistance of the four great villages, nobody will be able to prevent Kanoha's destruction. Orochimaru said confidently. 4. Even if Suna joins hands with you. It's unknown what the decision of Kiri would be. They might take advantage of this opportunity and assist Kanoha at a crucial moment to deal a heavy blow to four of the great villages. The third Kazakage said to Orochimaru, who simply shook his head. I have already talked about this with the third Mizukage. He has given his agreement that as long as Suna agrees to attack Kanoha, he would convince the Land of Waters Daimyo and lead Kiri's forces to attack Kanoha as well. His reason is that he feels a massive threat from Senju Araki. Upon saying Araki's name, Orochimaru paused for some reason and took a deep breath. It was as if he was convincing himself that Araki couldn't hurt him right now. That he was safe here. Very well, Orochimaru. I agreed to cooperate you then. The third Kazakage agreed to Orochimaru's idea but not before adding, however, not right now. We will be attacking after one year or so. A look of understanding appeared over Orochimaru's face, I see, you want to use Kanoha to weaken Kumo and IWA first. After destroying Kanoha, that location would be split between the four great villages. However, the portion acquired by a great village would depend on the strength of that great village. You want to show off to the other great villages that Suna is stronger than them due to the least casualties and attain the maximum benefit from this war. The third Kazakage frowned upon hearing Orochimaru speak his scheme so casually. Though it wasn't hard to guess, he still didn't like hearing it from Orochimaru's mouth. So, are you planning on keeping me here in this prison? Orochimaru asked the third Kazakage with that smirk on his face. The third Kazakage remained silent for some time before speaking, What can you do if I free you? These were the words that Orochimaru had been waiting for. He immediately replied, I know quite a bit of Kanoha's spies in Suna. I can assist you in finding them and dealing with them while not letting Kanoha figure out anything. Alright. The third Kazakage nodded his head, understanding that this was already quite a good deal. You will work with Ishimoto Sadao. If I hear that you have been working against Suna, he will eliminate you, Orochimaru. The one-tailed Jinchwariki? You really aren't taking any chances, Kazakage Dano. Even though he knew of this fact, Orochimaru's smile didn't vanish, it remained there as if he was happy of this fact. I don't mind working with the one-tailed Jinchwariki but do tell him to not interfere in my experiments. I will be experimenting on any Kanoha's spy I find in Suna, that's acceptable, right? Orochimaru asked the third Kazakage. Very well. With that, the third Kazakage and Orochimaru got to work. At this time, Jiraiya was returning to the Land of Fire. In the Land of Lightning, just as Araki had said, he had found Orochimaru's tracks and even followed him for some time, but the snake managed to slip away. From the Land of Lightning? He had no idea where Orochimaru could have gone. For now, 
Considering the location, he even believed that Orochimaru must have gone to Kiri. Although he knew of this, Jiraiya felt that it wouldn't be worth it to enter Kiri and search for Orochimaru. Knowing Orochimaru, he could once again slip away from his grasps. The war against Kumo and IWA had also started. Jiraiya wanted to return to Konoha and start doing missions to assist Konoha in winning this war. He did wonder what Araki had planned. The last he had heard from the third Hokage, the old man had stated his utter dissatisfaction with the Senju clan. He mentioned how the Senju clan head didn't even turn up for the emergency war meeting. Jiraiya understood Araki's character quite a bit more than the third Hokage. This wasn't just to spite the third Hokage, it seemed that Araki was displaying his intention of splitting the Senju clan from Konoha. The third Hokage was not at all hesitating in sending out a message that the Senju clan didn't care about what happened to Konoha. It seemed that he was getting anxious about the Senju clan. He really wanted to put it down. Moreover, he heard another piece of news. But this came from his spy network in Amigekure. It seemed that Araki had suddenly appeared in AIM and landed a blow on Hanzo. Moreover, Araki's attack was so strong that Hanzo was unconscious for three whole days. Although Jiraiya was well aware of Araki's potential, he naturally knew that sooner or later Araki would come to surpass them all. But this, this was too soon. But this was not all he heard from his spy network. It appeared that Araki had come to protect an organization named Akatsuki. The leader of this organization was none other than Yahiko. He remembered teaching Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato near the end of the Second Shinobi War. He even held hope that Nagato was the child of prophecy who was destined to save the world. Knowing that they were brought to Konoha from AIM, and they were even protected by Araki, Jiraiya couldn't help but let out a relieved breath. At least he wouldn't need to be worried about their safety. With Araki's current strength, even the third Hokage would find it challenging to harm the Akatsuki members. Moreover, one last thing was, Araki definitely knew of Orochimaru's current location. Once he finds out Orochimaru's current location, Jiraiya felt like he could plan further ahead. After having returned, the first thing Jiraiya did was report all he found out to the third Hokage. Jiraiya explained how although Orochimaru had stayed in the Land of Lightning, he didn't try to contact the third Rakage. Hearing this, although the third Hokage didn't show it, he was quite pleased. If Jiraiya did report that Orochimaru had colluded with the third Rakage, the third Hokage would be helpless and would be forced to put him in the bingo book with the status of dead or alive. However, the situation hadn't degraded too much, this was what he believed at this point. After having given all the information, Jiraiya took his leave. A cold glint appeared in the third Hokage's eyes as he saw Jiraiya leaving. He sent a few ANBU after Jiraiya? These were the ANBU members who were entirely loyal to himself. They immediately obeyed his instruction. The reason behind the third Hokage's current decision was naturally because he was aware of how Jiraiya's apprentice. Namike's Minato was present during the time when Araki arrived to place Akatsuki under his protection. Moreover, not just that, it seemed that even before Araki appeared, Minato was asking for an Uzumaki to come with him. He was with a Senju clan member? This all seemed awfully suspicious to him. It appeared as if Minato and Jiraiya were closely related to the Senju clan. He somewhat regretted sending good words about Minato to the daimyo. Perhaps he had been too hasty in his judgment. A moment later, he took a deep breath and calmed down. No. The situation was still not entirely hopeless. He just needed to deal with Kumo and IWA first. As long as he had AIM as an ally, IWA shouldn't be that big of a deal for Konoha. The one who held the third Hokage's main focus was Kumo, or more specifically, the third Rakage. Until now, although Kumo had sent their shinobi to the battlefield, most of them were merely genins. Or seemingly straight out of the academy. The Hokage didn't understand why Kumo needed to use such a tactic when they had the numerical advantage. Were they saving their elite shinobi for later? He had a feeling that this was the calm before the storm. As Jiraiya was going to the Senju clan manor, he noticed that the third Hokage had sent some ANBU after him. He couldn't help but sigh out, you really underestimate me, sensei. If you think mere ANBUs can follow me, I wouldn't have returned alive from the land of lightning. With that, he passed a tree and suddenly jumped down from there. 
The ANBU members were a little startled when they saw Jiraiya jumping down from that branch. After that, he seems to have started running in another direction. Some of them were curious about this direction, but one of them had an idea. This was the same direction as the hot springs of Kanoha. It went without saying that this ANBU member was a woman. And almost all the women ANBU members were aware of why Jiraiya would go to a hot spring. To peep obviously and to gather material for his pervy novel. As the ANBU members changed their direction, they failed to notice a man walking in the direction of the Senju clan manor casually. It was naturally Jiraiya. The one they were pursuing was simply a clone. Jiraiya knew this was an old trick, but he still liked to use it since tweaking it a little here and there, and it would still work. He observed his surroundings for some time and noticed that the ANBU members weren't pursuing him any longer. With that, he no longer hit his speed and rushed towards the Senju clan manor. As he was running towards the Senju clan manor, he passed through some of the training grounds under the Senju clan. Although he had been moving at a quick speed, he was still mindful of his surrounding. And as he was passing through the training ground, he saw some familiar heads. Unknowingly a smile appeared on his face. He wasn't the only one who noticed them, though. The blue-haired girl looked towards Jiraiya, and her eyes widened with some surprise, she called out, Jiraiya-sensei. This caught the attention of her friends as well. Especially the orange-haired kid. He looked quite excited upon seeing Jiraiya and rushed at him while shouting, Jiraiya-sensei, here. I am here. You brats. Stay quiet. Although Jiraiya wanted to say it in a stern tone, a voice choked with emotion was released from his throat. With that, Jiraiya decided to have his own reunion with Nagao, Yahiko, and Konan first before going over to meet Araki. At the same time, near Konoha and Iwa's borders, Hataki Kakashi had his first kill. For a young child, this was a crucial moment. At this moment, they would fall in confusion, not understanding just why they were doing this. However, Kakashi had no luxury to ask this question to himself. Right after he had his first kill, he was forced to fight against another. Kakashi killed him with a kunai through his throat. He was even a bit happy that he had picked up his father's skill in kunai by watching him train. Moreover, his mother also helped him in his training. He was quite good with dogs as well. As they returned to the encampment at the end of the day, Kakashi went over to the senior Chunin and stated his accomplishments. This was something all the genins were asked to do. According to their contributions on the battlefield, they would be further promoted. Hearing that Kakashi had killed five genins and injured three, the Chunin was a bit surprised. But after thinking about it, he felt that this was only appropriate. The White Fang naturally wouldn't have a weak son. Kakashi didn't care much about being compared to his father. He also asked the Chunin if there were any reports of how his father's side was doing in the war against Kumo. Apparently, the Chunin didn't hold enough authority to have reports of how Sakumo's side was doing in the war. As he was returning to his position, a teammate of Kakashi approached him and asked, Yo, what's up Kakashi? Guy? This was none other than my guy, the son of my Dai, a genin due to special reasons. My eternal rival, I heard that you are worried about your father, so I came to check up on you. He said while showing off his muscles. Ha? Huh? Kakashi had a sweat drop behind his head as he stared at his self-proclaimed eternal rival. He didn't understand why his own father had such a high opinion of him. He even mentioned how Guy would be a good rival for Kakashi. I am not that worried about my father. He is really strong, after all. But, Kakashi didn't continue ahead, speaking more would just be unwise. At this time, Guy shrugged at his words and pointed his finger at him, I challenge you. I will beat more shinobi the next time we go to a battlefield. You will? Although Kakashi seemed indifferent, a hint of spark did appear in his eyes. He didn't know why but winning against Guy gave him an immensely proud feeling. If nothing else, this feeling alone would make him want to win. And on the Kumo borders, the White Fang, Hataki Sakumo was in his tent, drinking a tea while staring at the map. He was confused by Kumo? From what he had heard from the shinobi, Kumo had only been sending genin ranked shinobi, from the genin ranked shinobis they had captured, they found out that these were simply academy graduates. Only a few were chunin ranked within them. The reason they talked so quickly was because of Yamanaka clan members. The Yamanaka clan members used their jutsu to get in their mind and attain the secrets known to these shinobi. 
Sakumo understood why Kanoha had enlisted Mir Academy graduates on the borders. It was mainly because of the lower number of shinobi as compared to the combined shinobi of IWA and Kumo. This was the only way Kanoha could fight against the numerical advantage held by these two great villages. However, Sakumo couldn't understand why Kumo would use such a tactic. They were sending Mir Academy graduates against Sakumo's men. Even the third Rekage should be aware of the fact that he couldn't hope to land a blow on Sakumo's men like this. And the Kumo's camp? It confused Sakumo as well. From the shinobi they had captured, he found out that only 11 or so Jounins were sent to administer that Kumo's shinobi. Knowing that it was a war between two great villages, the Kumo side appeared to be far too weak right now. Naturally, he sent this information to the third Hokage. After some time, Sakumo received an order from the third Hokage. I will be appearing at your camp and take over control. Until then, keep a group of 20 or so Jounins prepared. You will lead this group and ambush the Kumo's camp. Sakumo was shocked upon seeing this order. To think that the third Hokage would appear at this battlefield. It appeared that he was more worried about Kumo than IWA. Moreover, the second part of the order let him sigh out. He somewhat guessed that the third Hokage would give him this order. And right as he came out of his tent, he went to lay down in an empty field. Soon enough, his wife joined him, she found him by his scent. Are you worried about Kakashi? Sakumo didn't even need her to speak anything to know why she had come. Yes. Kakashi is just a small boy. Yet, the Hokage has forced children of his age to fight on the front lines. I can't accept this decision. His wife answered, showing a hint of displeasure at the Hokage's decision. I can't say I am happy with the decision, but I can understand the situation. And don't worry about Kakashi, I will be dealing with matters here quickly and request Hokage to allow the two of us to go to Amigekure or maybe request for Kakashi here. We can personally protect Kakashi then. Sakumo said to his wife with a small smile. His wife was happy at his words. But she didn't ask about his mission. She was well aware that since he hadn't spoken about it, then that means it was going to be a secret mission. She could only hope that he returned victoriously. Four days later, the Hokage arrived. His arrival was quite the secret, and only a few higher-ranked shinobi were aware that he had come. Meanwhile, Sakumo had prepared a team of 20 Jounins. It was the night time right now, and he was leading them to attack Kumo's camp. As Sakumo was leading the 20 or so Jounins to attack Kumo's camp, he had a rather bad feeling about this mission. He felt that something was amiss, but he couldn't place his finger on it. The 20 Jounins he selected were naturally quite skilled in stealth. Even as they were running, their steps made almost no sound. As they reached the enemy camp, Sakumo noticed that they hadn't lit up a fire to make sure they can't be detected. Well, that was quite natural. But he noticed a few guards near the entrance or the walls, patrolling the area quietly. He gave a few signals to the team of Jounins, and they all split in different directions. Waiting for some time, he signaled them. These Jounins who had been signaled immediately pounced on their respective targets. Their targets seemed to be 12 or 13 year old children, but at this moment, they couldn't be soft towards them. So, without thinking much of it, they stabbed the guard's throat before he could make a noise. It was unknown whether they were affected by killing children or not since there was no trace of remorse or emotion on their face. After having eliminated all the guards, Sakumo split his team into four parts with each team having five members. Out of four teams, two teams were ordered to go and target the 11 Jounin Shinobi in the Kumo camp. Sakumo ordered one team to act as their backup in case the situation turned bad. And Sakumo's own team was going to destroy the enemy supplies. This was the plan? As Sakumo's team went to destroy the supplies, they had barely reached the location when Sakumo suddenly heard a sound. He immediately called out for his team, Duck. Not at all hesitating after hearing his instruction, his team Duck. They heard a faint sound of something cutting apart the wind. As Sakumo's team had ducked, this thing was naturally targeting Sakumo. Without even turning towards it, Sakumo raised his hand and grabbed it with his fingers. The thing that he grabbed was a kunai. And as he grabbed it, he threw it just as quickly. Sakumo's team heard a series of metal sounds. The reason behind these series of sounds was that Sakumo's kunai hit a shuriken, this shuriken's direction was changed, and it hit a kunai, and this kunai hit another two shurikens. 
Meaning, Sukumo had effortlessly redirected Kunai and three shurukens just by throwing once. But even as these attacks had come from his left side, he still didn't turn his head. He continued to look straight while telling his team, abort the mission. You need to return quickly. Just after he said that he threw a few smoke bombs. The four members of his team immediately started to run in the Kanoha's camp's direction. Meanwhile, Tsukumo was going inside Kumo's camp to save the three teams in there. He had no idea that two dark-skinned youths appeared in front of the smoke cloud. One of them commented, TCH. He slipped out of our grasps. If they were just a bit ahead, I could have charged at him and prevented them from leaving. I want to fight, but they ain't ready to face my might. Cause I fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee. These leaf posers can't even hope to defeat the likes of me. I am Killer Bee. Well, although Killer Bee wasn't that loud in his words, the brows of the dark-skinned guy twitched. It seemed as if he was resisting an urge to punch the heck out of Killer Bee. There were seven more shinobi behind the two of them. It appeared that Kumo had prepared a good trap. Meanwhile, for Sakumo, upon arriving in the Kumo camp, he was shocked to see three of his teams, 15 Jounins, fighting against 23 shinobi. From their clothes and appearance, he was quite sure that these 23 shinobi were Jounin. Four of his comrades had even died by now. This meant that the information they received was wrong. No. That also couldn't be. It was extracted by a member of the Yamanaka clan. Then? This meant that even these Kumo shinobi in the camp were unaware of the presence of these 23 Jounins. All this time, this was simply a trap. The other Jenins and Chunins were waking up in the Kumo camp. This was getting bad? Sakumo knew he had to work fast, he couldn't be soft here. The first thing he did was create two shadow clones. All three of them pulled out the chakra saber and rushed towards three different targets. Although the shadow clones didn't possess great durability, as long as the person using them was skilled enough, even shadow clones could defeat Jounins. Just like that, he saved three of his comrades from the Kumo Jounins and signaled them all to run away. Taking a deep breath, Sakumo showed a serious glint in his eyes as he continued to block the Kumo Shinobi using his own body and shadow clones to allow the rest of his teammates to run away. Only when he was sure that eleven of his comrades had somehow managed to escape from this trap did he turn his head and try to run away. Naturally, many Jounins followed after him, knowing well enough that this was none other than the infamous White Fang. If they could injure him even at the cost of their own lives, it would be well worth it. However, Sakumo seemed to be anticipating their actions. They even used their lightning and earth jutsus to hold him down, but Sakumo somehow dodged those jutsus without even turning. He would somehow know just where they were targeting him and would dodge near the last second. And soon enough, the Kumo shinobi stopped pursuing Sakumo. One reason was that they were nearing Kanoha's camp. And the other reason was that they saw a blue lightning flash past them. They were well aware of who it was. Their third rakage, it seems that he had rushed as soon as he heard the news that Hataki Sakumo had come. The third rakage speed was truly impressive. He had nearly closed the distance between himself and Sakumo. He raised his arm and concentrated a lot of lightning chakra in his fingertips. The four fingers were pointed at Sakumo's body and ready to tear it apart in one go. This was the third rakage thrust of Hell Jutsu. Perhaps it was Sakumo's sharp intuition that told him of the immense danger. He immediately turned around and raised his chakra saber to block the incoming thrust of Hell. He knew well enough that overpowering it with a straight attack was impossible. So, Sakumo raised his chakra saber and struck the four fingers of the third rakage which were coated in the bluish colored lightning armor. Sakumo used all his strength in his body and raised it by a few centimeters, thus, deflecting the attack which could have taken his life. It would be rude of me not to entertain the white fang of Kanoha. The third rakage spoke his first words. Meanwhile, Sakumo resisted an urge to chuckle helplessly before he backed away and prepared to fight against the third rakage. Step by step, Sakumo continued to back away against the third rakage. He was well aware of the strength of this man. He was the only rakage who had gone head to head against the eight-tailed beast without any armor or weapon. His powerful body was strong enough to take on nearly any attack without leaving a scratch, and his offensive strength was strong enough to pierce anything. Although Sakumo was considered quite strong, he was in no delusion that he could win against the third rakage. But, since the situation called out for it, 
he also wouldn't be giving up at this moment. Although his teammates had left a lot earlier than himself, they were just a little ahead of himself. They had yet to enter the camp. If he let the third rakage get past him, he would surely go after them. Perhaps it was to save his comrades and the regret of seeing four of his comrades die that a determined glint shone in his eye. The third rakage immediately moved forwards with his top speed. He was currently using the move known as lightning straight. He moved at his top speed and aimed to punch Sukumo's face. The speed was so quick that most shinobis wouldn't even have the time to blink before being struck. But, Sukumo was not most shinobi. His body bent towards the left direction as he dodged the third rakage's punch. And before the third rakage could even attack him using his kick or punch, Sukumo raised his chakra saber and struck the third rakage's arm which had been stretched forward to punch him. The third rakage wanted to let out a cold TCH. This sort of attack was too weak. He believed that the White Fang was overestimating himself by fighting against him in close range. However, soon enough, he noticed small sparks as Sukumo's chakra saber hit the lightning armor on his arm. Most attacks weren't even able to pierce the third rakage's lightning armor, so he was naturally surprised when he felt Sukumo's chakra saber piercing it with such ease. The third rakage tried to use the back of his other arm to hit Sukumo's head. Still, Sukumo seemed to have expected it once again and ducked just at the right time before hitting the third rakage's stomach with a bolt of lightning coating kunai. This kunai pierced the lightning armor of the third rakage and managed to touch his skin. But upon touching, Sukumo was surprised that his strength was insufficient to pierce any deeper. Oomph. In all these years, not a single attack has managed to pierce my invincible body. You think your attacks are going to be any different, White Fang? The third rakage sneered while looking at Sukumo. Sukumo remained calm even after hearing the third rakage's words, I thought it would be better for me to first verify the rumors before planning ahead. It seems that the rumors about your body were no exaggeration. Trying to fight me in a close battle was a bad idea for a shinobi of your caliber. With that, the third rakage speed seemed to have gotten twice faster as he grabbed hold of Sukumo's body. I am aware of that. That is why. Suddenly, the Sukumo in the third rakage's arm puffed out with a burst of smoke. The third rakage's eyes widened with surprise. He let out a chuckle and thought, he truly does deserve the reputation of being even above the Sanans. I didn't even know when he substituted himself with a clone. Observing his surroundings very carefully, the third rakage soon found where Sukumo's location. He was behind a tree at this moment. The rakage rushed at Sukumo's position. He didn't try to change his route and planned to destroy all obstructions in his way. The tree in his way was naturally split into two pieces, and he continued to rush at Sukumo. Meanwhile, Sukumo was well aware that the tree would do little to obstruct the third rakage's charge. He had already jumped back while going through some hand seals. Fire style, dragon flame bomb. He breathed fire out of his mouth, and the flames were manipulated into the shape of a dragon and divided into three parts to strike the third rakage from left, right, and front. Because of the power of the technique and the amount of skill required to control it, only a few shinobi were capable of using this technique. The third rakage wasn't surprised that Sukumo could use such a technique. It was natural for a shinobi of his caliber with this control. He didn't even raise his guard and let the three parts of this fire dragon strike his strong body. Perhaps Sukumo was surprised, but he didn't show it. He landed on the stem of the tree before backing away, meaning that he was going towards the top of the tree while facing the ground. The third rakage appeared and punched the tree, smashing it into two parts as well. However, just as the tree was falling towards the ground, Sukumo jumped from the tree, he brought down his chakra saber, planning to thrust it down at the third rakage. The third rakage saw Sukumo coming at him and smirked. This was good for himself. Saved him the trouble of going after him. The third rakage raised one arm to protect his head while clenching his other hand. The third rakage noticed that the target of Sukumo seemed to be his head. He was quite satisfied with protecting his head with his arm. But he still kept on observing Sukumo's sword. For some reason, he felt as if it glowed with a faint bluish light. The third rakage guessed that it was probably the lightning chakra. Although Sukumo was using lightning chakra, the third rakage wasn't that worried about it. However, moments before being struck, the third rakage's eyes widened for some moments as he thought of something. 
He immediately moved out of the way and dodged Sakumo's strike. His dodge was at the very last second so Sakumo couldn't even stop his momentum. As he hit the ground with his sword, the sword tore apart a whole chunk of land and split it into two. The third rakage was a little far away from Sakumo, and he commented with a serious look, that was? Lightning chakra along with wind chakra. You somehow managed to use these elements at the same time. This was naturally a surprising thing. One reason was that there were very few people with wind affinity. So, mastering the wind affinity was considered the most challenging? Another reason was that wind and lightning would generally not mix well. It was next to impossible to use these two elements together because the wind would generally scatter the charged particles in the air. Meanwhile, Tsukumo's shoulders dropped as he realized he had missed this attack. For this attack to take place, he had to go on higher ground and jump from that location. Take control of the wind in the air and make it sharper as he went down. He was very careful in channeling his lightning chakra in his chakra saber and not let it leak out at all. This was a technique he had created after five years of effort. The name was Sky Drop. Yet, to see this technique miss. He was well aware that his shoulders and upper body had received a great strain as his chakra saber hit the ground. Although it didn't seem apparent, Sukumo couldn't move from his spot at the moment. He turned his head towards the third rakage and said, You are the first to have survived this move, third rakage. I dare not accept this praise. I have a feeling that even if you hadn't been able to cut apart my arm, you would have pierced half of my arm bone. However, it seems that you can't move after using this attack. This will be your end, White Fang. The third rakage said with a cold sweat behind his head. That was truly a close call. If not for the third rakage essay sharpened instincts. He would have really paid for his arrogance. The last time he had felt such danger from someone was when he fought against Uzumaki Hishin. Rakage Dano, aren't you being a little too hasty in deciding the fate of the Kanoha's White Fang? An elderly yet powerful voice was heard. This was none other than the man known as the third Hokage, Sarutobi Hiruzen. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.